listeners, welcome back to another episode of Dragon's Greed Gaming. We are very excited. We've got a great show in store for you tonight and a big milestone for us as we have reached episode 52, one year of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, and I hope you've loved it as much as I have. Well done, fellas. It's a and, very, very cool thing to reach. And what a glorious year it's been. It has. Yeah, hey, sure. congrats to all you guys. That's a full year for you guys. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, welcome back, listeners. As always, I am your GM, the Great Unclean One, and I will be weaving this tale of grim and perilous adventure, and I welcome you all back. This is Gallows Geist, our Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition actual play series, and we are deep, deep in this story as we continue to traverse the Reichland and the Old World. And uh, as always, before we dive too far into things, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. Uh, follow our Facebook page, Dragon Greed Gaming, Dragon's Greed Gaming. Uh, check us out on Spreaker, where we host the podcast. And be sure to uh, leave us a review and help us build the channel. We love to hear from you guys and uh, love to see what you think of the show and and let us know uh, how things are going. Uh, and with that out of the way, let us introduce our players around the table. Uh, we'll start off with Matt. Uh, I'll continuing to take up the mantle of Morthalion, the High Elf Wizard, as he continues his adventures with Skull Smasher, the Amazing Quarterstaff. Excellent. And Tyler? Uh, I am LaVolpe, the Talayan Duelist. All right, and Kyle. Hi, I'm Kyle. I play uh, Egon, the bastard with the bastard sword. Yes, good, good, good. Uh, unfortunately, Eric, who was our guest last week, is not going to be joining us tonight. He has some other family things going on, but he will be back to take control of our new witch hunter, Augustus Benedict, in the future. So we will get right to that. Uh, so yes, Eric will be back uh, next week to take control of our Witch Hunter, but we will continue to press on uh, as we continue our story here. So um, listeners, a couple things uh, before we start. So we had a couple things we did off camera here, so to speak, off mic. Um, I decided that the party did somewhat complete their long-term ambition, which was which was to track down Ashtar. Now, uh, part of that was obviously some of what the story unfolded, but part of that was them actually tracking him down in his hideout uh, where he they was holding uh, La Volpe. So I feel it's kind of a partial, uh, partially completed ambition. So I've given all of the players 250 experience, which is half of what you would normally get for a long-term ambition. I, I didn't quite think they deserved the full gamut there, considering uh, what had happened. So we did a little XP uh, expenditure before we started the show. So let's just go around the table and let everybody know what we did. And we'll just go in the same order that you guys introduced yourselves. All right. Uh, Mort spent his EXP to get some more ranks in the cool skill with his melee polearm skill and uh, some advancements in his weapon skill characteristic. I uh, did not spend any XP. Uh, I just want to save it for the next uh, time we go back to town, so to speak. Yeah, save it up. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Egon uh, got a lot cooler. Uh, he leveled his cool up to 15. And then level two-handed up to 15 as well. So fights are going to be a lot funnier coming up. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's going to give you some pretty epic uh, melee power, I think. Okay, cool. So yes, XP spent. Characters getting more powerful, more badass. And we continue to press on. So another thing uh, that we needed to discuss. So we finished our ambition. And I think we've had some new ones here. So, Mort, you had finished your previous short term. What was that, and what's your new one? Uh, my previous short term was to find a reason to continue adventuring with the Geist, as Mort was kind of faltering after the previous events. But after seeing the injuries and the evil what happened to the Volpe, and seeing the threat and danger that is Ashtar and his, uh, his, his companions, 
Morge has found renewed determination to continue on this quest and this adventure to track down Ashtar and put an end to some chaos threats that threaten all of us. So, so Morge's new motivation is going to be to pick up the trail of where Ashtar may have been going off to. All right. And then uh, our new long-term party ambition has gone from tracking down Ashtar to killing Ashtar as a defeat is not going to be good enough. His life needs to be ended and he needs to be stopped with whatever foul things he is up to. Uh, finally, one last little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, we had talked about silvered weapons uh, last couple weeks, and I did actually discover rules for silvered weapons, and the cost is a little bit different than what we had talked about, uh, Egon. So originally we did this as uh, a, like an item quality which uh, every quality doubles the cost of the weapon. However, with silver, there are two methods you can do. So the first is you can, um, for around two to three gold, because you have a larger weapon, you can get the weapon silvered. However, this is just kind of giving the weapon a temporary coat of silver that will probably over time dull and become ineffective. What this represents, or how it's represented in the game, is that if you ever uh, get a critical fail with the weapon, so you roll doubles and it's a failure, uh, the weapon loses its silvered ability and it gains the undamaging trait until it is basically fixed up again, uh, which will kind of turn your weapon into a wet noodle. Uh, undamaging is uh, sun weapons are not very good at penetrating armor. All armor points are doubled against undamaging weapons. Further, you do not automatically inflict a minimum of one wound on a successful hit. Uh, the other option is to get a weapon basically permanently silvered. Now, this is far more difficult, far more expensive, and requires uh, a true master of a blacksmith to do this. Um, however, doing this process can cost upwards of 30 gold crowns to do. Uh, so, the Long is definitely an expert blacksmith, and I will say that this is something he could pull off but it would cost more money to do so. So, with that in mind, is it something you'd like to uh, have done? Uh, yes. So, what would what would that have uh, cost then? So, we originally said it was doubling the cost of the weapon, and this weapon is eight gold, I believe, a bastard sword. Yes. Yeah, so, so it was 16. We said 16. Uh, I will say we'll just go with the rules here. We'll say upwards of 30 gold. So we'll say if you spend another, um, another what would that be, 14 gold, then we can call it even. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So your weapon is permanently silvered. Uh, it does not have a chance of getting dull or anything like that, other than regular weapon rules. Uh, and what it does, um, there are rules here. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what they are yet until they come into play, but uh, there are actual rules here in the game that I think are pretty awesome. So uh, I will tell you when that comes up. Okay. Uh, suffice to say, though, it's pretty legit. Sweet. And I believe some of you had also picked up some holy water last week. You had some stuff blessed by uh, Sister Holden, if I recall. Yes, I have a vial. Okay. Uh, I have one as well. All right. So um, I do have rules for this as well. But again, um, well, I guess you guys kind of already know because Kessler used some when you guys fought the zombies when you fought the... Uh, the necromancer way back at the start of the, the campaign so what holy water does is it does d10 damage halved rounding down minimum one uh, of of wounds but it ignores armor and toughness uh, on undead creatures that's awesome wow. 
And it, you know, obviously you gotta throw it or pour it on them for it to uh to be effective, and obviously it's one use. So I will Is there you... is there a way to do that in the trappings, like set that up? Uh when you go into trappings, um you can just just here I'll uh do you guys have access to the trappings table? Like where you can pull items out of the, the little bag here? Uh, if not do you guys see that up on the screen right now or no I, I mean not. we have access to the compendium no. packs with your items yeah if you go to it's the third from the right the compendium packs go down to trappings uh, just pull out any item maybe like a flask or if there's like a water skin or something add it to your character sheet and then oh. you can hit the little edit button, and then you can change all that stuff in the description. So you can change the name of it, you know, to be Holy Water, or Blessed Water, whatever you want to call it. And then you can add stuff in the description. You hit that little, uh, that little pencil icon right above the trash can, and you can change it. So what would we be changing it from? Uh, I mean, whatever. Just pick, pick any item, and then. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, like take a flask or wine bottle, anything like that. Water skin, just one of the Jarek little bag symbols, I guess. So, okay. And I believe that is all of our housekeeping stuff here. So, alas, we left. The guys had been in pursuit of the cult, as Lavolpe had been kidnapped by the cult of the Nine Eyes. Uh, your hunter Brent had led you guys on the trail, and you f uh, found a cave, like a tunnel system, in the ruins of a old temple out in the wilderness. You made your way through, fighting some of the cultists and slaying them, managing to capture one of them, and then you had tracked down the chamber where La Volpe was being held. La Volpe was brutally tortured, at least mentally, by the cult and Ashtar, as he was shown visions of the original La Volpe and his brother, who had taken up the mantle of La Volpe after the original one disappeared. Uh, during this, he learned a lot of what the Order was up to and what La Volpe and his brother, uh, what their parts were in that as well. Uh, but he refused to break, not failing a single corruption test, much to Ashtar's frustration. Eventually, the Geist burst into the chamber, fighting off the cultists and slaying pretty much all of them as the demon and Ashtar tried to work their magic and D'Artane opened fire with a crossbow. And eventually, the uh, well, there's a lot of miscasting and a lot of unsuccessful spells as Mort did a pretty good job of dispelling and keeping things in check. And eventually, the demon was put down again, along with the rest of the cultists. And as this was going on, Kessler managed to uh, land a shot on Ashtar, uh, even causing a critical injury. But Ashtar and D'Artane disappeared down a uh, like a dark passageway. And when you guys gave chase, you found that it looped back around into another tunnel and it seemed to lead towards the little underground stream or river that was there, and you lost all traces of them. You attempted to track them down, searching for the next couple days once you brought Lavolpe back to Gallo's End, but the search was in vain, and no sign of Ashtar or D'Artane was to be found. Uh, back at the chapter house, you guys had a bit of a debriefing, and discovered that a witch hunter you had met previously by the name of Augustus Benedict had returned, uh, being sent off on another mission uh, for Kessler and the chapter house here. And you, determined, you discovered that he was going to be in charge of your next mission. Uh, Kessler revealed that he had received a letter from the witch hunter general back in Altdorf that he had to make his way to the capital to give in-person testimony about what actually happened in Nuln. And unfortunately, this ha is happening right during the time that you guys are scheduled to go to Von Brunner Palace in Ubersreich to try to determine the relationship of the Von Brunners to the vampire you slew back in Spittlefeld. Um, and to follow up on an investigation that 
uh, Magistrate Von Bruner and Altdorf had asked you to look into after sending one of his agents to see what was going on with his brother in the palace. So, Kessler has uh, basically had a short dinner with all of you, asking you to all work together. From what you guys can tell, as it seems that Benedict is a bit more of a loner as far as a witch hunter and usually doesn't work with groups. Kessler kind of pointed out, I expect you to, uh, you know, to play nice and make sure you bring my men back in one piece. And uh, he quashed any concerns you guys had that Benedict might not be trustworthy after all that happened with uh, the Battle of Gallows End. So here you are with a new leader. Kessler is leaving the following day. And uh, the day after that is when you guys are going to the palace. Um, another thing that I had really not touched on too much last week, and I will admit it's because I was not expecting it, is what happened to the uh, cultists you guys managed to capture. Um, so I was not actually expecting you guys to pull that off, uh, so I didn't really have a whole lot ready last time, but I do now. So uh, rather than go through the entire interrogation like we did last time, uh, I kind of want to speed things up a little bit here. Um, but, listeners, have no fear. I can assure you it's just as brutal of an interrogation, if not worse, than the last one. So, Because uh, this one's personal for Kessler. So, needless to say, Kessler, uh, with the assistance of Benedict, uh, interrogate this cultist. Any of the three of you that want to be there during the interrogation can be. And But this time... Kessler pretty much takes full charge of it, occasionally maybe having uh, Benedict help him, you know, move some equipment or a device that he needs help with, but otherwise he does all of it himself. Uh, however, if there's anything that you guys want to ask or any information you want to try to get out of this guy, now will be your chance, assuming you're there during the interrogation. So um, which of you, if any, would attend this? I think La Volpe is definitely there. I would yeah. attend. I'd feel kind of responsible for him being there in the first place. So I've, I'd Egon's attend. there. Okay. So, Egon, this is something new to you. So, we'll give you a little bit of a, a taste here. Uh, in Gallo's End, uh, when you go past Kessler's office in the keep, uh, the hall eventually comes to a T-intersection. And if you go to your left, there is a single iron door at the end of the hallway and you learn that this leads down to a dungeon that is beneath uh, the bottom level of the keep. And the staircase goes off to your left and right when you go down to a small landing. To the left, you find out is where the cells, and like the little jail is, uh, which La Volpe is all too familiar with. But to the right is where they have the torture chambers. And there are three such chambers with big, massive iron doors on the right-hand side of the hall. And each of them opens up into a modest-sized room that has all sorts of implements of medieval torture. And it is pitch black down here, other than any torches or light sources that are brought. And there's things like the rack and an iron maiden and you know those typical big things but a lot of these are devices that can be used when the prisoner is strapped into a chair and that is what is done with this guy who is strapped into a chair and it is uh unsettling to say the least you've probably never encountered anything quite like this and it's definitely a different side of kessler that you see as he does not mess around um but you can tell that he is not doing this out of pure enjoyment. He is definitely trying to get information, and it's probably the most serious that you've seen him since you've met him. And he is uncompromising and brutal, and really drags it out uh, to get every scrap of information he can from this guy. Um, some devices you never would have even considered could be used for torture, and others you know, you, when he pulls out a certain item, you're like, okay, I have an idea what's going to happen here. So I would like you to give me a cool test for corruption here, because it is unlike anything Egon has ever experienced. Minor corruption. All of us? No, just Egon. You guys have already witnessed this before, so...
Okay. So it is unusual to watch. It's something different for Egon, but with four success levels, it doesn't really bother you too much, and perhaps you don't really uh, have too much sympathy for this guy. So um, is there anything that any of you want to ask or any information you want to try to, to get from this? And what has he given us so far? Okay, well, I will tell you guys uh, what um, what you've gotten so far. You discover that... So this guy tells you a couple things. Uh, he tells you that Ashtar was operating in Nuln since before you guys arrived. And Dartain was one of his agents. Uh, he's not sure if he's local to Nuln or just an agent that he's never really seen or met before. But he explains that Dartain's job was to watch over the meeting between Koch and the Skaven. And so he was there somewhere. You're not sure where because you guys never saw him yourselves. Uh, but he witnessed your meeting with the Skaven. And at that point, he reported to Ashtar that it was not Koch who had shown up. But at that point, they were not sure who you guys were. Um, it wasn't until Kessler came back into, or came to Nome that Ashtar put two and two together, and they figured out that you guys must be working with him in some capacity. Uh, at first, they just thought maybe you were like another random group of witch hunters uh, or something like that because of Firth. But once Kessler got there, they realized that you guys were working together. And this guy tells you that basically throughout your time in Nuln, Dartane spent a lot of his time observing you guys and watching what you were doing and reporting back to Ashtar with what was going on. He also reveals to none of your guys' surprise that... Uh, Oh, another thing. Well, two things. First thing that he reveals is obviously, as you guys know, Eladio, the um, Astalian that uh, smuggled Mort and Firth under the uh, the wall into the Altstadt district for the first time. Obviously, they captured him after he escorted you guys. So you find out that pretty much right after you guys got through and he left you guys in the Altstadt district. Uh, D'Artagne snagged him up, and next day when you guys went to go see him at his booth, you know, at the, the fish market, he was gone. And at that point, you know, he had seen you guys talk to him once or twice, and then uh, they tortured Eladio to death to find out what he knew and what you guys had spoken with about him. And obviously you guys find his body later. Uh, the second thing, though, that you find out, to no one's surprise probably no one's surprised at this point, is that Gorman was indeed working with the Skaven. Uh, however, this guy explains that the Skaven were blackmailing Gorman and had been doing so for quite some time, to his understanding. And Gorman had no idea of the cult's activities there and was kind of intentionally being kept in the dark. And what little this guy knows about Gorman's dealing with the Skavens is that, with the Skaven, is that it seems that he was getting information from them that was helping him uncover other forms of corruption and crime in the city. And so part of his reputation of being a really good, like, investigator and, like, a pseudo-witch hunter of bringing these cultists and mutants to, uh, to justice was because he was getting information from the Skaven. And this guy doesn't know how that arrangement ever started or, you know, what the exact deal was. But to his understanding, it sounds like Gorman was eventually being blackmailed by the Skaven uh, to help out with a bunch of things during the Nuln attack. And eventually, uh, Gorman seemed to start to stick up to the Skaven and didn't want to adhere to the plan. And the um, uh, D'Artane eventually discovered that the Skaven were planning on backstabbing the cult by having, uh, having Gorman and the secret police raid the cult's hideout. And that's why they split Nome. And when you guys got there, it was empty. D'Artane had found out that the Skaven were going to basically try to sell out the cult in hopes that 
Gorman would deal with the cult and maybe kill them or disrupt their plans. And since Ashtar found out about that before the Skaven uh, could move forward with that, by the time you guys got there, they were already gone. Um, two other bits of information is that you find out that they easily captured Wajit sometime when he was in Nuln. Uh, apparently, D'Artain most likely discovered that um, he was associated with you guys after bringing you into the city and had basically tracked him down sometime after he got to the market. And that was it. He was captured, he was tortured, and they tried to find out all they could about you guys. And then that's when they set up the trap here to try to get you guys, especially when uh, Ashtar realized who La Volpe was and that he was part of the order. And the last thing you find out about this guy is that the demon that was working with Ashtar, this guy claims he often heard Ashtar refer to it as Changeling. Damn, I gotta say, this little bird was singing. Oh yeah, this guy is, uh, this guy is terrified. Um, he tries to, to put up, but you guys can tell that this guy is probably like a, um, like a lower ranking member of the cult and a lot of this is stuff that he's telling you like that he heard or that he overheard you know it wasn't stuff that he was directly involved in and uh, this guy is terrified and even though this interrogation drags on for quite some time probably several hours uh it's usually easy to get him to talk and kessler does a a expert job of getting him to talk so if there's anything else you guys would want to f try to find out from this guy, now is your chance. Where else does the cult operate out of? I'm sorry, say that again? Where else does the cult operate? Where else do they have locations and bases? Uh, he, I mean, he tells you, you know, the, the cult is broken into several different branches. And, you know, he knows that there was... You know, one here in Uber's Reich, and he also has heard of one in um, uh, Marienburg and the one in Nome. Um, I'm guessing he doesn't know where Ashtar went. No, he does not. At least he claims he doesn't. But Ashtar was in Nome. They picked up Wajit, and they used that as a way to get to us. Here I don't know if Galazan. Ashtar was there. But the cult no, was no, he, there. He he said well one of you guys know from speaking with Kessler and uh Oliver that they had both dealt with one of the branches of the cult twice in the past in Nuln. So you assume when this guy says that that that's probably the branch that he's he's referring to but he did specifically say that Ashtar was there in Nuln himself before you guys arrived in Nuln presumably because the cult had this big plan with the Skaven to sabotage the cannon and it was important enough where Ashtar wanted to be there in person um was it Ubersreich the city where we encountered that one cultist leader who had like the piratish type chick we ended up like going to his basement and fighting off his collection of like you know cult items yes that, that was an Ubersreich yes okay yeah, Kurt Prochnow was that yes. guy, and, and Olga. And, and Uber's right, we are only a... <sighs> You're like a, less than a day's ride from Uber's right. Right, I right, I, I know we're close. Um, In Uber's right, what was Kurt Prochnow and his his office in that basement? Was that the only cult location that we found, or any other cult location that we came across in Uber's right? Uh, No, there was nothing else that you came across in Uber's right for the cult do know that he was the head of that particular branch of the cult. You do know there was more investigations followed up uh, that uh, Benedict and, and um, you know, some of the others were took part of to kind of track down other people that were part of the guild that Prochnow was in charge of to see if anyone else was actually part of the cult, but you don't know the specific what became of that. Yeah, because we never really did learn what became of Prochnow's collection, what may have been found within his collection. Well, you do. Well, you guys may recall that you actually went back there with Benedict the first time, and the warrior priest, and the two wizards, uh, Warnath, and then the uh, the light wizard, 
and they cataloged it. Some of it was brought back to Gallows End. The rest was taken back to Altdorf. Okay. Any other questions for your prisoner? What do you want on your tombstone? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's terrified at this point. Um, he still seems to think that maybe he might get out of this, but maybe he's not getting the hint. Well, unless there's anything else, uh, that will be the end of this cultist. I'm thinking, is there anything else I want to ask this guy? Um, what, what can he tell us about Ashtar specifically? I mean, he spent some time with him. What does he know about Ashtar? Well, what you find out uh, from this guy is it sounds like he himself did not have a whole lot of interactions with Ashtar. He just happened to uh, be recruited to, to try to capture, you know, help capture La Volpe and and that kind of part of the operation they were doing. But, um, you know, he, he tells you, you know, as far as he knows, he's the, the leader of the cult. And, you know, just about everybody seems to, you know, fear and or respect him. Uh, he's a very powerful wizard. And, you know, his, his armor with all the eyes really freaks a lot of people out. You know, just about everybody in the cult is a little nervous and, and un, you know, unnerved when they're around him but he doesn't know, like, really anything about his history or, like, where he comes from or, you know, anything like that. Okay. Um, does he know anything about Dartane? He tells you... Where is he from? So he tells you that, uh, he's not sure if Dartane is local to Noel and the cult there or if he's just, like, a higher-up member of the cult that he's never met but he tells you that D'Artane seems to definitely have Ashtar's trust and confidence, and um, he seems like a pretty... Uh, like, he's not like a hardcore fanatic. You know, he, this guy kind of describes him like he doesn't really seem like a cultist. It's just that he seems like a guy that Ashtar can rely on to, you know, do his spying. Like, he's basically, he's like Ashtar's spy is the best way to kind of describe him. He seems really good at getting information. He didn't He didn't strike me as like a, a cultist. He definitely seemed more like a mercenary kind of guy. Yeah, but this, this guy doesn't know like how he came into the cult or how he met Ashtar, what the agreement is. He just knows that like, especially in Nuln, uh, this guy was like Ashtar's number one man for getting stuff done. And it always seemed to be with, like, gathering information and keeping tabs on, you know, what was going on. So he suspects some sort of, like, maybe criminal uh, uh, attachment that, that D'Artagne might have. But, um, yeah, other than that, that's that's all he can really tell you. Is Marienburg in the Reichland? No, Marienburg is on the far west, almost on the west coast. Uh of the wasteland, which is the area to the west of the Empire. Uh, it used to be part of the Empire, and it, it's the only place that's ever successfully seceded from the Empire. Fuck those guys. Yeah, that's what most Imperials think of the Marienburgers and vice versa. But it's a very wealthy and prosperous trade town, and it is on the coast, so that helps it with its trade all the more. I'm just trying to get an idea of, you know, where they would retreat to. And I mean, the closest place they would retreat to would be in an Uber's wreck, but we kind of dealt with that branch of the cult. So in theory, they wouldn't go there, but I don't know. I mean, you know, the only place we'd know where they have a cult branch that, as far as we know, is fully operational is Marienburg, but well, that's a heck of a journey. I mean, what you, you guys can definitely tell from this guy that he doesn't know everything and you do feel like he, he's probably telling you everything that he possibly can because he's so terrified and he you know he does he wants this to end and he doesn't you know he doesn't want to die um so you feel like everything he's telling you is is truthful you know to some degree and he's probably telling you everything that he possibly can um 
but he definitely can get like this is just some dude who's in over his head and doesn't realize like how deep in he, he's really gotten or maybe the extent of how bad the people are that he's gotten involved with mm -hmm. anything yeah. else i think i'm good at this point yeah all right Egon? yeah all good yeah i'm all good okay well after many many long hours of this torture uh eventually this guy is executed and kessler does not give him the easy way out with the pistol uh this guy is taken out to the burning pyre and set ablaze and after hours of brutal torture uh, he has one final brutal moment as he is burned alive and his screams echo through the courtyard until eventually he ceases to live just the stench of his burning flesh in the air and Try so spread those that... corruption points among the, among the citizens of, of the gallows <laughs> Uh, and so that leads us to where we are now. So the next day, Kessler is preparing to depart. Looks like he's taking a couple horses and a couple of the guards are going with him. And then he's going to uh, uh, probably get on a boat and head north to, uh, to Ubersreich, or to, uh, to Altdorf from Ubersreich. So anyone has anything to say before he departs, now is your chance. Back in one piece. We'll try to do the same. Be careful. No telling what to expect, but as I've told you before, expect the worst. I'd expect nothing less. And, uh, you know, especially to the two of you, Mort and, uh, La Volpe, he says, You can trust Benedict. He's a good man, he doesn't have a lot of experience leading groups. He's a bit of a lone wolf, but he can get the job done, so follow his orders. I have faith in him. At that, I'll give him a nod and bid him farewell. Alright. Well, he mounts up on his horse with a couple of the guards, and they make their way out. Portcullis is raised, and him and the group disappear in the direction of Ubersreich. Leaving you guys one day to come up with your story for exactly how you're going to get into the, the palace. So again, you will be acting as agents of Heisman von Brunner, the magistrate in Altdorf, former witch hunter, and the brother of Heinrich von Brunner, the man who runs and basically operates and lives at the palace in Ubersreich. Again, there are four brothers. Uh, Sterlick is the oldest. He is the head of the family. He has the title of Graf, or Graf. So he is, you know, big, big potatoes. And then uh, Heisman, the witch hunter, or the, the magistrate, is the second uh, oldest. And then Heinrich, the one that runs the palace, is the third. And the youngest is, I believe it's Siegfried. Um, you don't really know much about him. And you are going there because Heinrich's daughter, Amara, is about to be, or she's betrothed, and this is a celebration a party to celebrate her upcoming marriage to someone. Uh, Heisman doesn't know exactly who. But you are to go there as Heisman's representatives and to give a gift to Amara and her soon-to-be husband and to basically put in the FaceTime and act as the representation since he cannot be there on his own. But while you are there, he wants you to see what you can find out and see if you can find any information about his missing spy, Annalisa Trote, that he had sent there about a month ago, and then to see if you can find exactly what's going on in the palace. Is there anything fishy going on? What's the deal with the servant who you found was a vampire? And all these weird, strange rumors you've heard, uh, mostly from Annalisa's report. And you guys will have the resources needed to get proper attire, 
but it is up to you to kind of decide what your story is as far as who you are and what exactly you do for Heisman. That's up to you guys to come up with that story. Uh, oh, what do you think, guys? And obviously, Benedict will be coming with you. I mean, Heisman is a former witch hunter himself, so I mean... Who's to say we're not just long lost acquaintances, you know, who were invited over to the party because, you know, from his former witch hunter life. Yeah. Ben Benedict uh, doesn't seem to like that. He's like, I think that's playing a little close to home of what we we're actually doing there. And, uh, you know, he's a retired witch hunter, so I think it might be a little far fetched that he would send old witch hunting friends to this wedding. Well, but also, too, we're supposed to investigate without, you know, if we say we're other witch hunters there, that's... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah all right. Yeah. Um, I say we're wine merchants, although I don't really know a whole lot about wine. Well, wine merchants would definitely be selling stuff for the party, but why would a wine merchant be invited to attend the party? Dude, wine is a big fucking deal back then, man. Yeah. Or spice merchants? I don't know. We could be like, just, you know. I mean, we could, yeah, we could be be wealthy merchants, and he's looking to basically earn our favor. So he gave us an invite to this, to his wedding, so we basically I meet the family. I to me that seems like something that's simple and believable enough, and also something we're not going to have to ask too many or answer too many questions to, I guess. Um, Benedict says, um, I think we need something a bit closer to home. I mean, he, we're being sent in his stead to go to his niece's wedding. I oh, mean, you know, sure. I don't think he would just send some people he's trying to start his business associates as a favor. Well, then we have to be family of some sort. Well, not necessarily family, but... I guess more direct employees, you know, like, you know, if, if, if we were Annalisa, for example, you know, one of his agents or bodyguards or spies or one of his, you know, clerks that works in his office out in Altdorf or, you know, maybe part of his, uh, you know, I don't know if he has any other lawyers that work for him since he's a judge, you know, something like that. Um, someone that works with him on a daily basis or is just maybe one of his servants, you know? I mean, as as he said in his letter, it's not unusual for these nobles to send their servants and retainers um, in their place. So I think we need to be someone a little bit closer acquainted to him, you know, and, and more of a part of his everyday life, I think. I could so see you being... that. Oh, I'm sorry? I was saying that, so a servant would be that, like that close. And that, that would make more sense than like, I mean, I guess I just don't understand the social functions. Uh, yeah, Benedict's like, yeah, I think, um, you know, like even, even, I mean, you, I'm sure you've experienced it in some regards, uh, you know, some servants can get, you know, pretty close and, and pretty tight to, to their masters you know i think uh uh kessler was telling me about uh uh that that guy you met that worked for ashenberg that uh brought you to the to the lodge um you know like he obviously you know he had ashenberg's ear you know trusted that sort of thing well, maybe not a friend you know still a servant and an employee but you know someone he would trust to do some of his more important things i mean you know keep in mind like he also wants this to look legit and so he would send people that you know are close to him so as not to insult his brother or his niece you know like hey i'm sorry i can't be here but like here's the next best thing you know like this is someone i trust enough to make like to act in my stead at my niece's wedding so if we were, say, sent there to, like, oversee, like, the marriage certificate was, like, officially signed and, like, properly documented for the family, would that, that not be close enough? 
Um, uh, well, I, th I think if, if we were to have any sort of, um, involvement with the actual proceedings like that, especially something as legally binding as the, the certificate of marriage, I think Heisman would have told us that, um, you know, I, I would imagine that, I mean, the, the Von Bruners, man, they got pockets deeper than you can imagine. I'm sure they've already got all that stuff planned out, you know. I Unless unless Heinrich asked his brother specifically to, to do something like that, I think Heisman would have told us if we needed to, to be a part of something that important. You know, it's basically like... Um, uh, I don't, I don't really have any good analogies here. I mean, I don't attend a lot of these things myself, but, um, you know, like he can't put the appearance in himself. So he's putting someone he trusts to do it for him. No, I totally get the idea. I'm just trying to think like how, how in depth do we need to practice our characters at being servants and what information do we need? And like, do we need another, we need another additional hook to get us believability clearance i guess is what i'm thinking right now he's like well if i mean if we're going to play the part of servants in some regards i don't think we need to worry too much about the specifics uh as far as like what we know i mean we can always play it off as you know that's you know it's something above my pay grade sort of thing um i mean we have some basics of, of what we know and if we need to i'm sure we can bluff our way through things. I mean, Heisman said it himself, you know, his family isn't aware of every single thing he does all the way up in Altdorf. Uh, you know, he doesn't see him on a day-to-day -day basis or anything like that, and most of the rest of the family is down here in the Reichland. I, not that Altdorf isn't in the Reichland, but you get what I'm saying. I mean, around here of Uber's Reich and some of the surrounding duchies and things like that, that's where the Von Brunner influence really is, you know. What would be the equivalent of a wedding photographer in Warhammer? Like an artist who like... Yeah, they would They would have like some sort of remembrancer or chronicler. You know, that would probably be like doing paintings and portraits and stuff like that. That's actually... Yeah, there'd definitely probably be someone, whether it's happening at the wedding or not, but I'm sure they would have like, oh, let's, you know, get the lord and lady of the castle together and pose for your portrait, you know? Because rich people love their family portraits hanging on the wall. I don't think any of us have any talent in doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> Does anyone have the trade art skill? <laughs> we, we, we bring in, we have like friggin' crayons, like, yes. all right. Yep, stick figures. And these and little shit. stick figure guys with the, and the girls got like huge boobs, like, yeah, there we go. <laughs> it looks just and like you. <laughs> from Leonardo, uh, what's his face? The, who's the Leonardo? Um, yeah, Leonardo Griano. Yep. For himself. It'd be like an uh, inglorious bastard trying to like speak German. Uh, bonjour now. <laughs> yeah, bonjour <laughs> now. <laughs> I mean, I guess we could serve as servants, and he were sent in his in his stead to over, you know, just uh, oversee the wedding. I uh, yeah, but, that makes most sense to me. Benedict says, if we're gonna play the servant thing, I think we should just kind of all have straightened out exactly what we do for him you know like are we a steward are we a clerk are we uh uh you know do we just wash the dishes i mean you know uh, well, we shouldn't be so down the totem pole because i think he would send um yeah it's gotta be bit. but you know keep in mind some of these families they have retainers for their retainers i mean I, you know uh, i'm going to uh <laughs> well here th then we can be uh sort of what our positions are like i could be, let's say i i teach his uh family combat arts he likes uh dueling and he likes learning swords and you know you know mort's the court magician or something like that you know and he's in it something i was I thinking know. that could be like a scribe and i've been sent to basically yeah. document the events of the wedding so that he has a personal recount of what's happening as i basically take notes of what's, what's going on yeah there you go uh, I could do bodyguard stuff. The gun's nice and simple, so it's not that much of a stretch. You could, yeah. Okay, those all all seem plausible. Uh, do you, any of you have any suggestions for what Benedict should uh, do? 
Mm, does Benedict have any special talents that we don't know about? Uh, well, let's... That could work as an angle? Find out. Gotta find his character sheet first. Here we go. He's like, um... Well, I, uh... I mean, I'm a pretty good shot, and, uh... I've been... I've been around a lot of the Empire. Could it be like a hunts master? Like, don't they have like someone that takes them out on hunts or something? Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, give me a charm test, Lavolpe. Ooh. Come At plus, in, uh... plus 20. Ooh. I'm gonna need it. Okay, you passed by it's one. Passed by one there. So as as he's saying some of this, uh, eventually Augustus also says to you, he's like, um, uh, I mean, I'm not an artist in the traditional sense, but uh, I I do know how to do a, a tattoo. Oh, well. What do you think that would make you then there? Do you want to, is, is like a tattoo artist something that well, you could just be as like an, an actual artist and basically draw pictures and of the events he has like a, a visual recreation of what's happening he can like draw the altar draw the bride and groom you know do portraits that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so you can bring those back uh when you say that um he starts to nod he's like that's that's actually not a bad idea mort yeah okay that's believable i think um, so I'll do the written stuff. He does the visual stuff. And okay. with, the, with our powers combined, it's like he's at the wedding. <laughs> he's no, like, yeah, he's like, yeah that's, that's brilliant. Um, he's like, uh, then um, who's who's kind of in charge of the group? And he Who kind of has looks the to Levolpe highest and, charisma. He looks kind of to Lavolpe and Egon based on what your fake professions are going to be here. I mean, oh, I'd, I'd go with uh, Lavope. I sure uh, it can be me. All right, then it's subtle. I, this is the second time I've posed as someone else, so you know it's going to be part of my trick bag. Okay, so uh, along with all the information that uh, Heisman gave you guys, he also provides you with either the actual clothing or the funds to procure uh, stuff, you know, for this. So we'll assume that you guys are all able to get disguises that um, can kind of help you fit in more. And, you know, obviously really nice clothes because this is a very formal, uh, formal occasion. So that's all been taken care of for you. Now, Egon, um, even though you are a, a bodyguard, and you are um, going to this event, um, you know, there'd probably be a little leeway with yours as far as whether or not you're allowed to wear any of your armor. Ah, uh, gotcha. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, anything else, um, you know, you guys might have to uh, not be wearing at the time. You might have to try to sneak it in somehow. You know, you guys can't just roll up and like, oh, I've, I'm wearing like my full suit of leather armor and I've got a sword and a blunderbuss and a pistol and, you know, a crossbow, a shield and a bastard sword like that. That's probably not going to fly. Yeah. So you guys may need to, um, you know, have stuff stashed somewhere and, and try to get it in somehow. Uh, we know someone in Uber's right who might be willing to stash some stuff for us. The, uh, the chick with the orphanage. Uh, what is her name again? Your favorite we, NPC. Uh, we got Ani in good terms uh, with her. Anika, Anika, I think was her name. And that, yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm just, I'm just saying more that like, you know, because you, you got if you guys are representing Heisman, you're, you're kind of acting as family. So you guys will probably have a little bit more leeway than some of the other guests as far as like where you can go or like what you can do when you're there. Um, but you guys probably aren't going to be able to, like, openly carry your weapons, except maybe Egon, if he's acting the part of a bodyguard, you know? Um, now, obviously, you could try to hide weapons on you, you know, small things, um, 
you know, La Volpe, you might be able to get by because you're going to act like as his, you know, his swordsman instructor or whatever. Mm. So it'd kind of be weird if you walk around and you didn't have something to get back that up. Because again, trappings, you know, the trappings you have kind of indicate, you know, who you are, you're trying to, uh, to present. So, um, that might be something to keep in mind as well. But you guys might be able to put your stuff somewhere so that if you need to get to it, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll be somewhere on the palace grounds. Cool. That sounds like so, a good plan. Mord, it's easy for you because you don't, you know, you know, your staff can easily act as a walking staff too. And, um, but uh, everybody give me an intelligence test at plus 20. Mort, you get this at plus 40. Founding success. Uh, negative three. Okay. Uh, it's, where am I, how am I not getting this? Intelligence. Uh, front page. Yeah, the front page. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. Uh, click down on the bottom number in the column. Oh, uh, thank you. And then what was it? Sorry again, Chris. Plus, plus 20. Plus 20? Okay. Uh, okay. Success by one. For those of you that pass, uh, you all uh, pops into your head. What do you do if somebody uh, recognizes or figures out that Mort is a spellcaster? Kill them. What's wrong with her? I'm a spellcaster. I'm a high elf. That's not that uncommon. I'm just something you guys are thinking you should maybe be aware of. I, I don't. I mean, yeah, that's a fair point. But me being a high elf, it's, it's I'm already naturally exotic out here, and you know, ha ha a nobleman having an exotic pet, so to speak, you know, a companion, that, that doesn't seem unreasonable or out of the ordinary. And I think that a lot of people in the Empire would I have no problem believing that High Elves are magical, because that's what they all know High Elves to be. Okay. Just wanted to point it out, that's all. Okay. Well, unless there's anything else you guys need to prepare, uh, it will soon be time to depart for the palace. Um, I'd be sure that I, uh, I gather some... Uh... A quill and parchment. Easy like, enough. Yeah, yeah, easy enough to get. Uh, I'll kind of just take like, I'll, I'll grab like just like some books from the library, just like when you look the parts. I like have some books in my character. Okay, that's fine. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure that my grimoire was kind of mixed in with the other books as well too. Okay, so what I would say for this, fellas, is that you actually have a pretty good list of exactly what you're bringing with. Um, so you guys will be provided with fancy clothes, uh, at least the, the three of you. For Egon, um, you can probably get by in your in your armor uh, if it's gonna, if you're gonna play the bodyguard part, but Benedict would point out that you should probably get all your stuff really cleaned up and polished so that it looks, you know, a bit more ornamental and decorative than actually, you know, I'm a mercenary type thing. Gotcha. Um, but as far as, like, you know, weapons and stuff, Egon, again, you can probably have your stuff on you, but obviously it'll have to be sheathed. Um, but you guys all need to decide precisely what you're bringing with. Like, you, you probably, except maybe Mort, if you've got, like, a bag with your books and stuff in it, you guys probably aren't carrying, like, backpacks filled with stuff. So, uh, take a moment to think about that. I think now is a good time to take our break here. You guys can figure out exactly what you're going to take with you, and then uh, we can jump back yeah. in here. So, you know, for Egon, you know, especially for you, like, which weapons are you, or, you know, like that kind of stuff are you taking with? So. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, Lavolpe and Mort, anything specific? Uh, you need to do or any questions about anything before you guys depart? Have you figured out what gear is coming with you? Yeah, I put my extra stuff in the stash. Okay. Right, yeah, I'm just keeping on what I normally keep with me, which is my sword, the sword breaker, the pistol. I'm not taking my wizard ropes with me. I'm just going with the uh, 
the fancy stuff. I'm gonna my robots back home. Uh, Lavope, do you have your pistol, like, on a holster somewhere? Or is it tucked away, trying to be hidden? Is... I guess I would ask... Hmm. There's no one really to ask. Maybe Gaius. Is it proper to keep a pistol on you? Or sh it, it would be hidden. It's probably better, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, actually, Gaius is a, is a great resource here. He can probably tell you a lot. Uh, he would say that... Um, you know, even if you were like the lord of the house, generally in a situation like this, having any weapons on you would be considered like bad form, uh, especially the pistol, because it's kind of like, you know, amongst, you know, nobles, like a dueling weapon. So he says, you know, you should definitely try to have that uh, that hidden somewhere. Got it. Um, he says the other weapons, you know, based on what you guys are going to try to portray yourselves as, it shouldn't be a problem. You know, like if there was a, a military person there, like a soldier, you know, if they've got their sword strapped to their, their side or, you know, to their back, you know, it's not ideal, but um, don't expect to see a lot of people with weapons walking around except, you know, the guards of the palace. Like you said, it's it's for some people, it's it's all cleaned up and it's ornamental and it would be if it was like an officer or something. Like exactly. That. If the like, you know, it's like a Marine, right? If a Marine shows yeah. up and it's full, you know, his uniform, his dress uniform with his hat and everything, and everything's all polished up, like, that's fine. And you obviously there's there's a, a bout of respect that's like, oh, that's, you know, that's an active member. You know, he gets like this, you know, I don't want to say special treatment, but he has a reason to be in that dress uniform because that's his profession. So same kind of thing for perhaps you and Egon, you know, like, well, what kind of bodyguard if you are you if you aren't ready to, to like, take somebody down if something goes down, you know? Yeah, exactly sense to me it's like you know the secret service might not be wearing like military battle gear but you know they probably have like bulletproof vests on and you stuff know, like that so that motherfucking thing on him yeah <laughs> Kyle's back wonderful all right Kyle um sure. what are you what are you taking with you or what are you leaving behind I guess Last okay so uh Weapons wise, uh, bastard sword will just uh, strap to my back, um, leaving the uh, axe and the shield. Okay. And then I'm assuming the the dagger and the knuckle dusters I can hide on my person. Yeah, that's easy enough to hide. Um, yeah, so those those would be my weapons, and then you know, whatever's too, you know, auspicious to bring around, like in a backpack or something I'll just leave behind too. Yeah, I would say as far as like any carrying containers, you guys could have like any like pouches that attach to your belt or something like that, but you can't have like a backpack or a sling, you know, like one of those big ass like Santa sacks strapped over your shoulder. Um, more, you could probably have your, your silverware. Sling. Yeah, Matt, you could probably have your sling bag with all your books in there. Yeah, you know, I was planning on keeping that. That makes sense, so, okay. Okay. Um, well, Augustus, uh, is similar, um, in that he does not bring, well, his main crossbow is going to be, like, stashed somewhere. He's not actually going to bring that in. Um, same thing with, like, his leather armor. He's not gonna, uh, he's not gonna have that on him. But he is bringing his, uh, his, um. Uh, he's got like his 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 dagger slash knife hidden, and he's got his crossbow pistol hidden as well, and then uh, the other stuff will be stashed away somewhere. So, so eventually, the night finally arrives when it is time to head to the uh, uh, to the party. Also, if anybody has their holy water, you probably don't want to forget that since you specifically got it for this. Uh, oh, and one thing I forgot to tell you, LaVolpe, you had asked if you guys knew what the wedding gift was. So you do know, although you're not able to see it, but in uh, Heisman's instructions and letter and everything, he explains that it is a pair of gold bangles, one for Ama uh, the niece and one for her soon-to-be husband. And it has the Von Brunner crest engraved on it, and it has their names engraved on each one. You know, so one for her and one for him. Very lovely. So, yeah, okay. it sounds like it's so, expensive. 
Um, just for clarification, then yeah, I'll have uh, I got holy water in uh, in my pouch. That's fine. Cool. Okay. Well, lo and behold, the time comes, and you guys finally get to go to Von Brunner Palace. Now, oh, do I not have that map loaded up? Hold on here. Oh, I don't. Okay. I don't have the Ubersreich map, but that's okay. So, when you guys get to the city of Ubersreich, um, there is a part of the city that... Here, let me see if I can get this for you guys so you can actually see it. I know how much Matt likes his maps, so... Yeah. I, I aim to uh I aim to please here. I still like to stare at that province of Reglan map that's so much on there. I know, man. There's a, uh, um, they've got another one coming out for the city of Mindenheim. I think it's already out because that book came out. But uh, some cool stuff there. Okay, let me see if I can upload this really quick for you. And if not, we'll deal with it next time. Are there in-depth maps like the one you have for Reichland for all the other provinces too? No, not not to that detail. There are okay. some okay ones that you can find like on the wiki and stuff like that that are I think are pretty good because um, they're all done in the same style too. So at least they they look the same. I'm not sure where they came from or if it was a fan-made thing, uh, but those are pretty good. But yeah, as far as for the that the RPG they did, there's nothing quite like that that I've ever seen, which is too bad. Maybe in some of the old uh, RPG books, there might be. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in second edition, so. This is the map of Ubersreich, which I'm sure Mort and Le Volpe are familiar with. Much like Nome, it is built on a city, as many major cities in the Empire are. Or it's built on a river, and there is the big massive bridge that we all recognize from Vermintide in the middle there. Now, you guys know that this section here, the Morgan site, is the super rich district of the city much like the Aldstadt district in Nome that is where all the high ups and all the very rich families are located um and so that is where you go and much like in Nome where the Aldstadt district is kind of built on an ever rising hill with the palace at the very top the higher you get up this kind of gently sloping hill of this section of the city the the richer and the more prominent you get and to no one's surprise von brunner palace is at the very top of this hill uh, which on here is this big ass building right here in the middle the only thing that's bigger is black rock castle which is the castle the previous residence of the uh young freud family and so that's where the ruling family would live. That is currently occupied by part of the army of Altdorf that has since kind of seized the city. But uh, as you can tell, Von Brunner Palace is pretty gigantic. Um, and so when you guys enter this area of the city, you know, this area itself, this section of the city is walled off and there are very strict choke points or checkpoints to get through. And you guys uh, take a coach. Once you guys get into the city, arrangements have been made, so you guys have a very nice coach to bring you there, so you look the part. You're just going to walk in on foot. And, I mean, this coach is probably the most luxurious thing any of you have ever seen. Um, maybe not for Mort from being back in Uthwan, but at least here in the Empire, it is high quality. The, the thing is spotless. It looks polished, uh, nice black sheen. And um, you know, from one of the, the coaching, uh, you know, services here in the city, it's not a private coach or anything, but you guys definitely paid for, or a nice one has been paid for, for you guys to ride into. And you go through uh, this part of the city, and as you get there, the outside of this hill is where all these very high-end shops are. And you can see that if you have money and you want item X, Y, or Z, 
if you want the best money can buy in the city, this is where you come. So this is where, like, the most high-end armorers and smiths and bankers and restaurants and all that sort of stuff is here. And as you get further into this section and up the hill, you start to see very large residences, you know, houses which become manors, which become mansions, and obviously the richest of the rich are here. And no matter where you are in Ubersreich, you can pretty much see Von Brunner Palace poking up at the top of this hill. It is fairly high up compared to the rest of the city. So you uh, you make your way into this part of the uh, of Uber's Reich. I've got some flavor text I'll read to you guys here. So the Morgensite district of Uberstreich is the most affluent quarter of the city. Also known as the Hill, is an elevated area that slowly rises above the rest of the town. At the base of the hill are the most high-end shops, where one can find the most luxurious goods and services. As one moves higher up, they are greeted by the homes of the city's wealthier middle class. Further up beyond these homes, they turn into estates, mansions, and manors to the most wealthy. Sitting at the highest point on the hill, and viewable from nearly anywhere in Ubersreich, is Von Brunner Palace. The estate is enclosed by a large but decorative and practical stone wall, and the grounds outside are, kept, are lush and well kept. Finely crafted stone walkways lead through the garden and the rest of the estate grounds. Well-watered trees, shrubs, and flower beds line the grass. The main gate into the estate grounds is located on the western wall. Just beyond the gate sits a large coach house and stables, where visitors' coaches and horses are tended to. At the far north of the estate, there is a second gate, which you can see leads to the boathouses that docks the family's private barges. So you get to this main gate that enters the Von Brunner territory, and there is this very nice, clean, uh, about six foot stone wall that surrounds the entire estate grounds. And as you guys are let in, there are a couple guards watching the front gate. Um, as you guys are let in, you can see there are a couple other coaches and obviously people showing up for this event. Now it is about 6, 6.30 when you guys arrive. The sun is starting to set. It's not quite nighttime yet, but there's enough light to see where you're going. You guys make your way through this gate and your coach uh, leads you to basically where you're going to enter the palace itself and then your coach will come back and probably be lined up here with all the others and the private stables and anything. So as you guys make your way through the palace grounds, you can see that this place is huge. Many, many acres of land. The grass and all the trees and shrubbery are uh, very well kept. The grass is green and lush. Nothing looks out of place or dying. Uh, everything is well gardened, well watered, and many of the trees and shrubs and bushes are uh, trimmed into various shapes, obviously, like, like tree sculptures. Um, now, as you, you also notice that the ground is very finely paved, uh, even more so than the rest of the city obviously something that's been custom made and you can hear the, the clack of the horse's uh, uh, hooves as you make your way towards the palace itself. Now, the, the keep of the palace itself is located near the center of the estate grounds at the highest point on the hill. And it is a bit of a distance from here to the main gate or the gate that leads down to the boathouse. Uh, but you can even see from here, because you're kind of at this elevated position, there's this other gate that leads to another section on the north part of the grounds um, over here. And that's where you can see the uh, the boathouses, and there's several of them, which obviously each of them probably holds a barge or two. Because, you know, why have one barge when you can have several? Now, the keep itself 
is surrounded by a massive, and I mean massive, stone wall that is the uh, equivalent of the mightiest fortress you guys have ever seen. And it looks to you like more or less like a squarish, rectangular shape. And there is, the road leads up, this paved path leads up to where there's a drawbridge. Now, there's not a moat or anything like that around the castle, the palace, but it's kind of up on, like, almost like a plateau that's kind of raised up from the rest of the hill. And while it's not extremely sharp or, or very high up, um, there's basically a big open channel between the side of the ground that you're on and the, the part of the plateau that the actual palace is on. So they do have a drawbridge that can be drawn up to basically seal the, the palace off from any access to the outside. Obviously, the drawbridge is currently down, the portcullis is up, and there's two big watchtowers on either side of the um, of either side of the path. Stone, circular watchtowers with kind of that angled shape where it's wider at the bottom and gets narrower at the top, and then the very top has your typical um, kind of battlements uh, look. Those are on your side of the drawbridge. On the opposite side of the drawbridge is the massive, massive wall, and within that you can see the center of the castle. And we're going to switch to a new map here. I will have to do a little Fog of War revealing, so... few cartoons are performed live, Bart. There's terrible strain on the artist's hands. <laughs> have a little, little narration here as I do this. This would be a lot easier with a, a Wacom tablet, or a Wacom tablet. Sure. Okay, so that is the rough outline of the palace, more or less. So there should basically be a large area in the middle that you guys don't see yet, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the, the interior of the palace and also like the, the outside of the palace. Yes. It would appear. Okay. So. And perhaps some sort of like a storage room, something like that in the, the northeast corner. Okay, good. So, you guys enter from the west side of the map here, and as you can see, there is a massive, massive wall. This right here where it says ground floor, this is the wall. And it stretches up, you're guessing, probably 50 to 60, maybe even 100 feet. And I think I forgot another image, which would have been really helpful here. Very different music compared to what we're listening to. Yeah. Well, we're at a party now, so... Yep. Hello. Ho oh, ho, he's back. Sorry, reloading. Yeah, I accidentally shut down the server, so just log back in. Your head so, explode. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, listeners. I uh my my skills of not knowing everything around Foundry here is clearly showing tonight, so my apologies. Great year long episode, Chris. Jeez. Worst GM ever. I'm having a great time. <laughs> well, you're about to go to another party, so you're going to have even a better great time. Hell yes. Even a more great time, if that's even possible. Even even a more <laughs> great time. I love it. Uh, so here is what you guys see when you first come through the archway under the portcullises. This is the front of the palace that you guys see. So as you can see, it is this massive massive structure uh, that looks like a castle. I mean, it is completely stone. There are two massive towers. You guys can see right here on the map where my cursor is. These are the two towers that you see on either side of the door, which in the image um, you can see on the very left and right. And then in the center is the big wooden door that uh, leads inside. Uh, at the top, uh, between the, the top of the two towers, you can see what looks more of like a residential area, which looks like probably on the second or third floor of the palace. And then you can see be behind that, 
going up high into the fading light of the sky are two or three massive towers that stretch up at least another three to six levels, depending on which tower you're looking at. And you can see in between two of those towers, there appears to be a, a stone walkway that connects them. Um, on the very right-hand side, you can see there's kind of like a wall that juts out from the tower on the right-hand side. On the map, that's this over here. You can see on either the north or south side of the map, so on the left or right of the, the cast, the palace itself, the wall extends out from the palace to the outside wall that encircles this entire area. And there is a door, an opening in either of those walls. And as you guys get closer, you can see that it is another portcullis gate that basically divides this front courtyard in half to another courtyard that's like the back half of the uh, the palace. And you can see here there are like height dimensions, not that your characters can tell exactly how high it is, but you can see the top of the very tallest tower is quite high into the air. And as you can see, uh, yeah, where it marks off 90, that is where the wall is so the wall is about 90 feet tall that surrounds this castle so when you guys are here you cannot see outside the castle walls in any way um it's like you're you know like in like a big pen basically now i have another picture here to show you which basically gives you a kind of a, a three quarters view of the castle to give you more of an idea so this would be, if you're looking at our map, our top-down map that we have, this would be from, like, the southwest corner. Um, so in this overview map, the left-hand side you can see is uh, oh. the front. And you can see kind of the cutout. It kind of breaks it up for you. So you can see how tall these walls are with just a sheer Ooh. drop down. Um, oh, actually, there is there is a railing. My mistake. I didn't think there was a rolling. It's just cut out in that one spot. Uh, so you can see, it's huge. It's massive, and you can see that beyond these two portcullises, there are uh, other courtyards in the back. And in the courtyard in the northwest corner, I'm sorry, the northeast corner, the, uh, it's labeled number four here on the, on the map, there is a big building, which you guys is guessing perhaps a... Uh, a stables or a coach house for like the family itself it's obviously they don't have their stuff yeah over here uh so that is that is what you guys see um i think i can give you guys access to yeah, here we go if you guys go to your journal entries you should now have access to both of those images front view and overview if you guys ever want to look at them again mm -hmm. right, got it perfect. yep okay just give you an idea and as you can see with the overview uh the one that's got the cutout you can see that it's kind of up on this plateau and so even if you were to like somehow get like in order to get to the base of the wall you're climbing up basically a cliff face that from the outside it looked like wasn't too tall maybe like 30 to 50 feet but still like really difficult to get to the base of the wall and then you're just at this massive sheer face castle wall so not exactly easy to get into and so you guys approach uh at this point the coach drops you guys off and then you make your way through this pathway on the west side of the map you walk past the two watchtowers outside across the big channel you cross the drawbridge and then you cross under this gatehouse where the two portcullises are and when you get out into the courtyard here and you look behind you you can see the doors that lead into either of those gatehouses where you're assuming the mechanisms are for the drawbridge and for the two portcullises that are in uh, in between the gatehouse otherwise you're in a massive massive courtyard that is fairly empty 
Um, it's still very nicely put together. It's not as decrepit as the map would have you believe. Um, everything is very finely paved out here. There's really not much tree or shrubbery life. Uh, it's very much um, stonework and very clean. There isn't like ivy or anything like that grown on the walls. It is very nice. And the scale of this, uh, even for you, Mort, having been, you know, around some of the elven places back in Uthwan, it's just this building is huge and you're like why the fuck does one family need a place this big uh it's insane um and then you guys make your way through uh this front door right here and there is i believe there's a guard here it's a big map just give me a second here Okay, so you enter these two doors, which are currently open, so that you can get inside. And when you do, um, you guys are in like a small audience hall. And there's another set of doors beyond, another set of double doors. And in here, in this entryway, there are these two large gargoyle statues on either side, on your left and right, and their mouths act as braziers, where there's a fire lit with probably some sort of coal keeping, or wood keeping the fire going. Um, there is currently a guard, or not a guard, there's some servants that are letting people through this next door that you see. And when you uh, get through that, now again, don't worry about what's actually on the map here. You might see some terrain and stuff that isn't quite there. Uh, so I don't want players to worry about that. You know, just worry about how I describe things. But anyway, you come to this next room. And I'll just give me a minute here to kind of show you everything. You come to a massive, like, audience hall. And it looks like this is where the primary... Um, some of the primary party is going on and that and just a little more over here Ooh, there you go okay so you're in this large kind of octagon shaped room there are four massive pillars kind of equally spaced uh to support a domed ceiling that has some fine artwork painted, maybe some sort of fresco on the top. And um, you can see this place has been set up as the main place for the guests to assemble. There are many tables here. It reminds you a lot of the, uh, the, the Countess's ball back in Nome. There are many tables that have been set up here to show um, uh, to display food and you know there's a couple seats here and there but it looks like mostly it's for people to kind of stand up and mingle and to your left there is a massive staircase that goes up and to the left to the next floor of the palace uh, the floor here is some fine tile and stone polished to a sheen very expensive everything in here looks stupidly expensive way over the top more than anyone would ever need there's another set of double doors opposite the ones you came in on the opposite side of the room that lead further into the palace and on the right hand side you can see that the room opens up into a large hallway where you can see there's another hallway or two and, and another set of doors uh, most of the guests seem to be gathering in this large octagon-shaped room right here, but you can see a couple kind of mingling in this hallway over here, and there's something in this alcove uh, just down the hall. You do see, uh, other than there's there's a couple people here, you guys, it seems like maybe some of the first to arrive, but at this point it's around 7 o'clock, and the guests are starting to arrive and assemble. There's also a stage set up, um, where there is a band that has been set up and they are playing some music and everybody is finely dressed. Everything is nicely decorated. The food looks incredible and 
you know, it's not quite as opulent as the Countess's ball, but all of you still feel very much uh, out of your um, out of your depth. And there may or may not be a cat in the dining hall too. Uh, that is what you guys see. Uh, to the uh, the staircase, you do see that there is a guard guarding the staircase. It looks like not really letting anyone pass. And I will give you a picture here in just a second. Um, that's right, cat. It's a guard. We're guards. Where is the picture? How do I? Oh, here we go. Okay. You see a guard covered in head to toe. Um, uh, with armor. And... Um, I hope I didn't just fuck that up. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah. Is the song we're hearing the song the band is playing right now? Yes, it is. Okay, excellent. <laughs> uh, what it what does it does it give you any text on this guy's picture? No. No. Nope. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> um. Secret enemy, secret vampire. <laughs> so, what you can tell, um, I don't know, because on mine it shows all my text for everything, so I just want to make sure. So, you can tell that this is a guard that means business. He is covered head to toe in armor, uh, with a metal breastplate, uh, you know, metal armor covering his shoulders and arms, metal gauntlets, uh, probably some sort of chain skirt or chain leggings. Uh, with very heavy leather boots, and all of uh, this guard in particular um, has like a cape hanging from his shoulders with some sort of animal skin kind of up on the shoulders that keeps it attached, and he has a metal helmet on, a full helm that obscures pretty much his entire face, just covered in shadow, and he's got a massive sword uh, strapped to his back, and uh, Egon, you recognize it instantly as a bastard sword that uh, this guy has. Now, the sword is not drawn, but this guard cuts a very intimidating figure and is, again, guarding the stairs. Um, and does have kind of this, this cloth on him as well, kind of hanging, you know, where the, the armor isn't obviously padding or some of the clothing underneath. But, yeah, these guys look like they... They know what they're doing. This guy looks professional. And you can see occasionally it looks like someone is permitted to go up the stairs, but it looks like uh, there's a small line of people waiting to go upstairs for whatever reason. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's servants running around here and there, getting things uh, set up, bringing out more food, bringing trays of drinks and hors d'oeuvres and things like that. And there are many people starting to gather here as uh, as the party gets underway. And congratulations, we have finally made it to this fucking party. The amazing party. <laughs> Uh, so there you are, all kind of like fish out of water as, uh, as you sit and, uh, kind of just take it all in. All right. Um, is this, this is our last moment probably to talk about things with each other before we I mean, we it's go up in. to you. Um, so. I kind of take over, I guess I'll take everyone aside and be like, let's, uh, let's go over things we want to accomplish tonight. And uh, see how we're going to work about them in case we get separated inside. Oh, I would say you guys will probably have this conversation as you're getting there. Uh, oh, okay. Because once, once you guys get there, obviously the servants would uh, introduce themselves and find out who you are. You know, okay. quote unquote, check the guest list and stuff like that. And when you guys reveal that you are basically family or family representatives, uh, they're probably going to bring you to go see... Um, uh, the family, or at least tell you where they are. So you guys will have a chance before you step in there to kind of say anything you want to say. And at this point, 
um, any gear that you're not going to carry, uh, it looks like you guys can, like, give to the servants and they'll tuck it away somewhere for you. So. Um, because obviously you're family too, technically, so you imagine that you, you know, you might be able to, quote unquote, stay the night if you were to, uh, you know. I mean, it's a family home, right? It's a castle, so they're probably not just going to kick you out and be like, all right, thanks for coming to the party. See you later. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I guess. <sighs> Lavope's concerned because he feels like the Countess's ball wasn't so successful when uh, we went to investigate it. And uh, I guess maybe he feels like he was underprepared to speak to the people that was there and it just really like didn't go his way um so he wants to have more success at this party an accurate assessment of what happened yeah all right like we we talked to the countess and like uh, you know we tried talking to other nobles and it just really didn't go anywhere we really didn't find out a whole lot so um yeah so our to-do list is to find out any information we can on Annalisa, which was see if anyone knows Annalisa or anything that may have happened to her. Um, we need to get an idea of if anyone's been acting peculiar in the family. Because I guess we're, the real reason we're here is to investigate the possibility of vampirism throughout the family. Yeah. I suppose that is a tricky subject. You can't exactly go around asking like, eh, does no. she only come out at uh, night? Um, question, Chris. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know vampires have their own magical lore, the lore of vampires. If someone was a vampire, would they be giving off like a magical aura? Well... Honestly, you don't know, because when you fought the vampire in Spittlefeld, she did not seem to be touched by the winds of magic. But then again, you were earlier in your career as a wizard. You weren't nearly as powerful as you were back then. And I know you recently gained the, uh, was it Magical Sense talent? Correct. So um, she very well could have been a wizard, but if she was, she never used any magic to your knowledge. Okay. That's right. They're all going to die. Good cat. Mm. Um, what other goals do we have? So we have those two goals. What other things we want to be asking for while we're here? I mean, that's the main thing. You know, you guys want to find out the connection to the vampire, which again, she appeared to be a servant of the Von Brunner family because she was wearing their crest on her uh, her clothes but she was clearly wearing the clothes of a servant you know, did she steal those or was she actually a servant here you don't know but that's how actually, she appeared point. that's a good question actually I don't I don't think she stole them but uh, that's an interesting point we definitely want to speak with Heinrich we want to speak with the bride-to-be, which I'm finding that person's name. Uh... Yeah, I need a quick refresher on some of the... Uh... Oh, you got your lore master. I mean, Matt, you're kind of like the scribe. You actually take all the notes, too. I I'm, love I've, I've got some <laughs> notes here, yeah. So uh, Heinrich is, is the, the... He's currently the I don't need to know of all... Bruner Palace, but right. Um... Amara is his daughter. She's the bride-to-be. Okay, Amara, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I believe Heisman had her name in the letter, I'm pretty sure. If not, you'll find it out really quick, so no spoilers here. This cat is so soft. Say hello to all the listeners, kitty. Tell them how much you love Warhammer and how much you hate dwarves. I should have reread this letter earlier, but looking at the uh, the note that Heisman sent us, let's see. 
Uh, now, question for you guys. If I put, I'm going to put your tokens in this room labeled as eight. Does that change your vision at all? Uh, moved my screen. But did it change your vision at all? No, looks the same. No. Okay, so you can you can obviously because I didn't set up walls on this because that was gonna take forever. So fuck that. Um, so you guys can you guys can move off where the fog of war is, but just so you guys can have a, a reference for where you're actually standing. Um, again, this isn't super to scale. Um, it's just it's too big to make it truly to scale. But I'll put your tokens there just so you guys have them. Uh, and I'll put tokens of other NPCs that you guys meet as things become important. But, you know, there's at this point when you guys get here, there's maybe, you know, about 50 people or so. And it's quickly filling up. And you guys can tell this is going to be quite a, uh, a party. Oh, yeah, if you zoom in, man, you can really see the detail on the map. That's cool. And I'll expose this over here. I mean, eventually you guys can at least walk over as you can see that this hallway stretches out and there is another guard and he appears to be guarding a stairwell that goes up and down. Aha! So you can see, uh, actually, whoever made this map is really awesome. You guys can see that the the darker part of the stairwell indicates that it goes down, and then the, the the regular colored side is where it goes up. So it is a spiral staircase that goes in both directions. Whoops. And finally... Well, we'll have to sneak in there. Uh, finally, I'll let you guys see that guard that you see is equipped differently than the other one. Uh, this one that you see, let me do the artwork here. That's the token. Hold on. Now, this guard is also in fairly heavy armor, um, but there's a few key differences, which I'll show you here in a second. So uh, they are wearing basically full metal armor, you know, helmet, shoulder guards, gauntlets, uh you know, leggings and breastplate of some sort, perhaps chain mail. And they've got the tunic kind of slash dress over the armor that has the Von Brunner crest on it, which um, it's not what you see here in the picture. But these guys are armed with spears. Uh, and unlike the guy who has the bastard sword, this guy, he's got the spear out and he's holding it like you'd hold like a staff. So the point of the spear is pointed up. He's holding it, you know, off to his side and is very clearly on guard there. Uh, but he does not have a, a cape or like the animal fur like the other one does. Oh. Something I'd want to try to do is figure out what's all the commotion is the and what's the queue for people wanting to go upstairs. What, what's what's the interesting thing up there that they're only letting people in one by one? Okay, so you guys yeah, would easily yeah, find yeah. this out either by asking or the servants when you introduce yourselves. Um, you know, I guess actually we should probably role play this out a little bit. So you guys get to this front door. There's a servant there letting people in. Um, actually, here's his picture. So we'll put him over here by the door. I guess I didn't give him a token. Whoops. Well. Fucked that up, didn't I? That's okay. Uh, so this gentleman that you see looks a little bit older. And there you go. He's got somewhat long hair, like just before his shoulders. A very full beard with the mustache. And he looks like he's probably in his 40s or 50s. He is dressed very nicely, but you can tell that he's definitely a servant of some sort. And when you guys see him, uh, for Mort and Lavolpe, he kind of, his dress reminds you a bit of Vern, uh, Lord Ashenberg's, like, right-hand guy. Um, but he's, you know, dressed very finely. Um, you probably see the Von Brunner emblem like on his ring or maybe on a necklace that he has and he seems to be kind of 
he's got another another servant next to him that's got like a list, but he's kind of greeting the guests, letting them in and introducing everybody. And uh, you guys walk up to him and he says, uh, uh, good evening, uh, my friends. Now, who might you be? Lavolpe, why don't you go first? You're yeah. our, our, our leader here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I make a introduction um and i you know introduced myself as uh heisman uh, von bruner's uh i i guess sword swords master i'm gonna say uh and then i'll introduce mort as a uh, scryer and uh egon as uh, i'll introduce egon last because he's a bodyguard and then um God, i'm sorry i can't remember all these Names. That's okay. Uh, it's okay, man. Uh, Augustus, I know there's a lot going on. How do you think Augustus, I feel? <laughs> yeah, dude, and you have like three thousand names. And Augustus, <laughs> as uh, uh, as our uh, as an artist, and uh, we are here with a you know a wedding gift for is it Amara? Yes. Oh my God! All right, six for six names, uh, Amara, <laughs> and also you know that we're uh, we are also here to. Uh, we will be doing some uh, artwork and uh, and uh, scrying for the guests and uh, for uh, the bride and the groom. Uh, and I make a, as a formal bow as I can, as I know how, which I guess I probably do. Um, okay. uh, my question, when you introduce yourselves and the others, do you give any names? And if so, what names do you give? Oh, we didn't. We really didn't think of. Uh, nope. So you're on your own on this names. one. What do you What do you say? I I, you know, I, I realized that last moment, and I I just call myself uh, uh, Rodrigo uh, uh, Empanada. <laughs> Empanada. <laughs> Who's everybody else? Uh, this is um, uh, Bort Thalian. Bort. Court Thalion, and uh, this is uh, Reinhardt. Uh, I introduce you as Reinhardt, and uh, Augustus is uh, Octoberus. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, okay, give me a charm oh, test. Oh yeah! Please. Charm test. Let's see if I remember all the fake names I gave us. Right. Better write those. Better write those down, boys. Yeah, uh, definitely right, write those it. down because I don't. I already Rodrigo, forgot. Rodrigo, Bort, Reinhardt, and Octoberus. I like Reinhardt. That's a good one. Uh, I wait. Did this? Really, really, we with Bort Plus for two. an name. Okay. Oh, well, I still have from Simpsons, but. Okay. Plus uh, two degrees, friends. He says, ah, very good. You said you were here on behalf of Lord Heisman. Uh, yes, we are very sorry he could not attend. Uh, but uh, as his faithful retainers, we hope uh, we will be able to act in his stead for him. Okay. So you would have like a letter to present to someone that basically proving mm. your credentials. It would have Heisman's seal on there, still stamped and unbroken. And then we'll say that... Um, Augustus is carrying the gift, you know, the box that has the gift in it, which of course is nicely wrapped and, you know, the, the fucking wrapping paper is probably more than a typical peasant makes in like, you know, half a year. Right. Um, but uh, so he he's, he says, OK, and he, you know, he opens the letter and he looks at it, he cracks the seal and he reads it over for a moment. He says, ah, well, very good. I'm sorry to hear that Lord Heisman couldn't make it, but he is uh, a rather busy man in, a, in an important place. So. Um, it's it's good to see, and I see you've brought something for our bride to be. Uh, yes, it's very uh, very lovely. Uh, do I hand it to you? Um, he's like, uh, yes, uh, we'll take that, and he takes it and he hands it to um, uh, one of the uh, the servants, and he says, uh, you'll have a chance to present it, obviously, um, when uh, when the time comes, um, and then he, you know, he kind of checks a few things off on a list and talks to the servant next to him and then he kind of motions he says if you need anything tonight my name is Elias I am Lord Heinrich's steward here anything Ooh. at all ask me. did he say Elias or Elias sorry Elias Elias 
Yes. Elias, uh, the pleasure is mine. And I uh, go to shake his hand. Thank you for your uh, hospitality. Uh, yeah, Elias uh, Brandt is his name. Elias Brandt. How do you spell that? E L I A S. Okay. Uh, when you guys hover on his token, does it show anything? Nope. Should it? Uh, no. It should say steward, but for some reason it doesn't, so whatever. Bye. Probably the stupid configurations for the tokens. Oh, that's why I hovered by owner. Hover by anyone. How about now? No? Uh, no, I think you have to remix the token when you make oh, changes wait. like that. You're right. God, this fucking... How about now? Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay. I can hey. change it to Elias since you actually know his name now. Okay. Um. So yeah, he, he kind of, you know, greets and lets you guys uh, come into the room. And it is opulent and well, well fit, fur, uh, furnished. Lots of nice food. There you go. And there are plenty of people here, like I said, and there's more to come. Um, and as he, he you know, brings you in, he says, um, feel free to help yourselves to anything you wish. And uh, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to get myself or one of the other staff here. And uh, when you are ready, just let me know and uh, we can go upstairs and you can present yourselves to uh, Lord Heinrich. Oh, is uh, ah okay. Is that what is uh, the line? Yes, yes, of course. Everybody wants to make an appearance, as you know. Uh, everybody wants to bend the ear of the the Lord and wish, you know, give their wishes to the newlyweds. Well, to to be newlyweds. Very good. Uh, yes, uh, perhaps we will uh, we will take a little walk around and we will come back. Okay. Uh, and with that, I'll usher the group forward and we'll make our way into the party and maybe take a look around and then figure out uh, what we want to do next. See who there is to talk to. See okay. Who to see. Well, uh, as the time goes on and more and more people get here, it is very clear to you that there's pr there's at least over 100 people and there's still more showing up. Uh, this is turning out to be quite the event and starting to rival that of the uh, uh, actually probably getting more than what the Countess had at hers because this is not only uh, like just people, but it's also family. So it's turning out to be quite a big event. And you see there are many groups that are similar to yours where there is obviously someone of import you know, a nobleman or some higher ranking individual in the city or maybe in the family, and they have a small entourage of, you know, retainers and servants with them. So you're thinking that, like, probably only a, a third of these people are the actual guests, and the other two thirds are, like, all their people they brought with them, you know, to just be, you know, oh, I've got to have my... You know, I've got to have my, my dude that, you know, polishes my shoes or, you know, hands me my coat or, you know, whatever it is. So you see a lot of similar things like that. And um, for the most part, you feel that you do fit in. You definitely have the dress. Egon's probably the outlier here because he's in full armor. You don't really see any other people like that. If there are bodyguards, they seem to be a little bit more subtle, maybe. Um, but for the most part, you guys seem to fit in. Um, there are many, many people here. Uh, however, there are a few that catch your eye. Um, if all of you would give me a lore uh, Empire Reichland test, um, Mort and Lavolpe, you guys could have plus 20 on this. Uh, Mort, are you, you're not hiding your ears necessarily, right? They're... Nope, I'm full, full high elf at the moment. Okay. Full on high elf. That's right. Oh man, look at this cat. He totally crashed. You okay down there? <laughs> so would I go uh, Lord Talbeckland? Yes, uh, but that'll be minus 10, because this is something specific to the city. And if I don't have the skill, I just do a straight int? Yes, but yours will be minus... Um, wow. You've been at Uber's Rec for a while, so I'll say minus 10 for you as well. Okay. Plus one. 
Woo! Plus one. Wow, with a critical. Wow, okay, so Egon, one success. Mort, two successes. Lavolpe, one success with a critical. So uh, somehow, uh, between the group of you, I guess I should roll for our uh, resident witch hunter here, too. I can find his character sheet. I have so many character sheets in this little little thing here. Um, he's got some sort of lore, I'm sure. Maybe not. Hmm. I guess not. Well, do the old intelligence test for him then. Oh, this is this is not going to be great for him. Wah, wah. Okay. Um, well, between the three of you, uh, especially because you've been in Uber's Reich a couple times, you are able to piece together several of the guests that you see. And let me show you a picture that... Okay. So this is a picture of several of the prominent people that you see here. And as, as the time goes on, you know, over the next hour or so as you're mingling and talking to people, you can definitely tell there are those that garner more attention than the, than the others. I mean, everybody here is obviously rich beyond belief and important in some way, but there are some that definitely stick out as you see them. So this is a, a picture of some of those people that you see. Um, you don't see all of these people right now, but maybe over the course of the dinner you will. So you First do see... Now. Um, yes, we'll get to that in a second. So these people that you see here, uh, between the three of you, realize these are pretty much all the council members that make up the council of Ubersreich. Um, with Ernst Mahler, the Burgomeister, being like the mayor of the town. And the rest of these people are the heads of different guilds that pretty much make up the powerhouse guilds of the city. So the carpenters, the carters, the metal workers, the boatmen, the boat builders and chandlers, and the merchants guild. Um, the two on the right, you do not see, but you guys would definitely know of them. General uh, Gendrik von Debernick is the general of the Altdorf forces that have occupied Ubersreich. Um, he is a very respected and well-known individual, and he wears his hair kind of in the style of like it's the twin-tailed comet. Um, he is not here. You do not see him anywhere. And the woman on the right, you know as Lady Emanuel Nacht, and she is the Imperial Herald. She is one of the highest ranking people out there, and she was specifically sent to Ubersreich by the Emperor himself to oversee the situation in Ubersreich as there is now this void and vacuum of leadership. So she's kind of the brains behind the operation, and Von Dabernick is definitely the brawn being in charge of the army that's currently occupying. So they're both representatives of the Emperor, uh, but being an Imperial Herald, um, all of you would know to some degree that that is a very high title, but you do not see her anywhere either. Um, and then between the rest of you, you see these other individuals, except for Kurt Prock now. So I know this is a different image than what we had in the past, but uh, I have deduced that I'm pretty sure that is Kurt Prock now's actual character art. Um, so obviously he's not there because we know what happened to him. So we yeah, have Owen. Ernst. <laughs> we have Ernst Mahler. He is the Burgomeister, the mayor of the town. Um, and he is, he, they all dressed pretty much as you see in this image. He looks every bit the part of a noble with a massive floppy hat with these huge feathers and big old thick mustache kind of arched up. Very typical imperial style dress. There's a huge guy that you can see in the picture behind him named Ernst Zimmerman. He is the guild master of the Carpenters Guild. And he is this big, tall guy, over six feet tall, very broadly shouldered and heavily muscled, with a big, thick beard, kind of scraggly, equally thick uh, mustache, large nose, heavy brow, and um, 
you know, he's dressed nicely, but he's definitely got more of a working man look to him uh, to some degree. Then there's this kind of large individual, a bald-headed man with just a little bit of hair on the back of his head, a clean-shaven uh, with a large, large face and um, like double chin, and he is wearing very fine, expensive clothes as well. You know that his name is Hans Furman. He is the guild master of the Carter's Guild. Uh, then there's a short, stocky What's woman. What's a Carter? A uh, Carter. So I actually I have done a lot of research to find out what the fuck a Carter is because I didn't know, and my research seems to indicate that Carter, the Carter's Guild, basically carts stuff around, whether it's people or mm -hmm. goods. So logistics. So they're uh, like teamsters. Teamster. Yeah, they teamsters. Uh, you know, like a taxi service, I guess, to some regards. You know, not actually like a coachman's guild, but. Yeah, I think Teamsters is the best way to think of it. Uh, then you have this short, stocky woman who has some kind of curly, dirty blonde hair. Um, she's not fat, but she's stocky and kind of well-built. And she, you know her as Petronilla Merkel. She is the guild master of the Metalworkers Guild. There is another very scraggly older guy, probably in his 40s or 50s, looks like he's got a couple scars and is definitely the dirtiest and unhealthiest looking of the bunch he's kind of tall but he's a bit scrawny and scraggly you find out this is karsten rugger the guild master of the boatman guild uh and then finally there is the woman on the very far left which for some reason they don't actually show you her face very well but that is Marta Mueller, the guild master of the Merchants Guild. She is a uh, fairly attractive woman. She definitely has the look of a noble with the typical puffy imperial sleeves on her garb. She has kind of a, a cape slash cloak hanging from her shoulders. And other than Ernst, she's probably, I mean, she's definitely the nicest dressed of them. With Ernst's hat, especially, you guys just get the impression that he's kind of like flamboyant or kind of a show off. But her dress looks sincere, I think is the best way to put it. Her hair is very nicely done, and she definitely looks more of like a dainty noblewoman compared to the rest, especially when you compare her to the other woman, Petronilla. You know, she looks a bit more like a working woman to some degree as well. Uh, and then there is, well, there would have been Kurt Prock now. Um, you don't know if there is a representative of the Boat Builder and Chandler's Guild here. If there is, you don't know who that is or what they may look like. Is um, it well known what happened to Proc now at this point? Um, you guys haven't spent a whole lot of time in his Uber Strikes. So you don't really know the story. But what I will tell you, this is mostly because of Lavolpe is critical. You do know that these uh, two, four, these six individuals make up the council that kind of controls Ubersreich to some degree, and they are the six most powerful and prestigious guilds in the city. And so if anybody could start to make a claim to power, it could be them. And what you also know, um, La Volpe, I got a couple other notes here for you. Mm -hmm. Um... So you know that before the young Freuds were removed from power by the Emperor, uh, the Burgomeister's role was fairly clerical in nature. You know, he didn't have a whole lot of power. He was just kind of a, a placeholder, I guess. But now that the young Freuds have been taken out of power and there is no true ruling family, even though the Von Bruners and the Ashenbergs are trying to make their, their peace here. Um, no one has actually done that yet. So you know now that the Burgomeister actually has a lot more power uh, because he is kind of like the mayor of the town. And now there's a lot of rumors that Ubersreich might become a Freeburg, which is like a free city that is able to operate kind of independently outside the the taxes and some of the governing of the you know the rest of the empire it's still part of the empire but they're given a lot more free reign to kind of do things as they want um 
you know that because of this, this development in the situation of Ubersreich's politics, that he is constantly being courted by these other guild masters, especially these six here, uh, that are trying to take advantage of the situation to raise the position of their own guilds. And a rumor that you've heard is that even though he's kind of enjoying this newfound freedom and and like kind of surge of power and popularity he also actually appear uh, sounds to be somewhat of a cautious man and he's tr actually trying his best to try to satisfy everybody and keep the peace and not let it go to his head and not try to make like a power move but his outward appearance and what you've heard of him is that he is very kind of obnoxious and arrogant and flamboyant and very showy, but the, you know, supposedly the truth of the story is he is a little bit more down to earth and he is actually trying to do what's right for Ubersreich. Of course, he probably wants to increase his own standing as probably anybody would in that situation, but you've, you've heard some mixed things and that maybe he's, you know, what you see is not necessarily what you get with this guy. So between the group of you, those are the main players that you see here. Um, obviously, you guys can try to find out more as this goes on. But those are the ones that you see and that you, you know, you hear of and you know of. Can we get this image added to our journal? Oh, boy, yeah, I was trying to here. save. I was trying to uh, save it, but I couldn't take a screen cap because of the service. This is kind of an important uh, picture here. Um, I can't right now because it's on the other computer. Fine. Okay, that's fine. I will do that for you. Oh, that you know why? Because I did this is one of the first things I did, and I didn't realize I could add it as a uh, a thing to the journal. Okay. Oh, actually, wait. Hold on. Let me see. All right, well, ask any other questions while I see if I can access it or not. Is that an entire chicken on his hat? Uh, it kind of looks like it, yeah. I mean, it's Warhammer, so probably. It probably is, yeah. <laughs> it's Warhammer, you're right. Is this actually an official piece of art for all these characters? Yes, this is out of the Uber's Reich book. And they're ah. not labeled. I had to label them myself and try to figure out who was who based on description. <laughs> so shame on you, Cubicle 7. Could have done a lot better here. I mean, some of them were easy to figure out, like General uh, Dabernick and Lady Emanuel knocked, but the other ones, it was like, okay, well, who's who here? Well, Knox Knight in German, so yeah. that one bitch is 100% a vampire. I know that off the bat. <laughs> is this um, right now? Well, keep in mind, late. you do not see Lady knocked, or you do not see General Yeah, because she's here. a vampire, and she's busy sucking someone's blood. Oh, wait. Oh, my God, do I have access to it? I think I do. As soon as she enters the ball, we'll just kill her on sight. I mean, we should kill all of them because they're probably guilty of something. I mean, if Procknow is guilty, I mean, we know Procknow is guilty. Right, we only yeah. assume the rest of them and are kind Warhammer, of guilty And it's Warhammer, so yeah. they're they're all 100% guilty. They're, wow. You know, you know, Chris, I walk over to the curtains, I cast a fire fire hand and just light the whole, light the whole place down. All right. Damn, bro. Yeah. Oh, I think it's working. Seal, magically seal the doors. Dude. That's right. How much do you guys love me right now? On a scale of 1 to Even 10, eh, about 3. 11. Look in, your, look in your journal. Boom! Getting it oh done. Oh my nice. god. Nice. Chris, you get the MVP award for this week. Yes, 25 experience. You, Chris, this week you get 25 experience. Man, I get to level up soon. <laughs> Gonna be so good. Oh, man. Um, so, uh, okay, so Lady Noct is not there. Nope. Um, and there were two others. I, I'm gonna, uh, you know what? General, General Dabernick, you do not see anywhere, and you uh -huh. do, obviously you don't see Kurt Brock now. You don't yeah. know if there's been a replacement for him or not, so if I'm there gonna... is, you're not sure that is. What, what's, uh, what's, uh, Mr. Rugger doing, the boatman? He's probably knows some shit. Looks like right now he's just talking to a couple other looks like hardworking folk and he's hanging out with uh, the head of the carpenters there. Uh, I'll, uh, you know, meander around way and uh, see if I catch their eye at all. And then I'll kind of just try and make pleasantries with them and introduce myself. Okay, and 
Um, let me just check one other thing here. I'm just trying to remember where everybody is and who's doing what, so just bear with me. Yeah. There's a lot of rooms and a lot of text. Uh, okay. There are two other people that you see as well, so I will point them out to you here. Um, you see two individuals that um, you're guessing are siblings. They look somewhat similar in some ways. Uh, younger, probably teenagers, if that. And they seem to have quite a few people either trying to talk to them or kind of following them around. You're not sure who they are, but you're guessing they must be somewhat important. Um, so this is the girl that you see. And then this is the young man that you see. If I do this, can you see both pieces of art at the same time? Uh, yes. no. Oh, it, it collapses one and shows the other? Oh, d oh, the second one is small. It might be behind the, uh, the they, girl. They just pop over each other, but I can yeah. see them together, like, if I move okay. the windows around. Perfect. Okay. So those are the two that you see. Uh, they both, again, appear to probably be between, like, 15 and 18. Um, and they... like Leon. A little bit. They are very, very oh. nicely dressed. Is it Leon? I immediately make friends with him. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sorry. I see them on, just, on my way, or they yeah, just they, they seem they, to have a big crowd. They, they, yeah. Uh, and they're they're, they're kind of standing together, and they seem to have quite a big entourage around them. Before I go talk, I'll I'll just kind of. Uh listen in to what people are saying or what they're talking about okay, maybe uh, maybe grab a or is there someone that has uh going around with drinks so i like at least have a hand occupied so i can of course like i'm course. doing something so i'll yeah. grab a drink and i'll you know get some drinks for the guys and uh you know okay try and listen in to what they're talking about well uh so as you do that um Augustus kind of looks to you, Mort, and he says, well, I uh, suppose we ought to get to work. And he, like, takes out, like, his, like, quote-unquote sketchbook, and he, like, goes over and starts, like, kind of, you know, drawing the scene, you know, to kind of look the part. Um, he takes the drink that you give him, LaVolpe, and then he kind of wanders off to, uh, you know, pretend, well, not pretend, but to, you know, do what he's supposedly supposed to be doing. Yeah, I'll definitely take out my parchment and my quill as well and uh, start documenting the evening's events. Yeah, I'll be sure to describe in detail the how, how lavishly everyone is dressed and, cool. um, you know, the, the, the describe the decorations, the food on display, and, and you know, all the little finer details and start making notes of those. That. Chickens used as hats. <laughs> um, at this point... The, f the first guests that are admitted, it's around 7 o'clock. So between like 7 and 7.30 is when you guys arrive and the hall is starting to fill up with people. The two doors on the right-hand side here, the opposite side of the hall, you do occasionally see people coming in and out of there. So it looks like that's open as well, but you're not sure where that goes. Um, again, people are also going into Section 9, but you do not see anybody go, go up or down the stairs. Or if they go down that hall, the guard blocks their path. And these doors over here um, appear to be locked. Um, you maybe see one or two people try to go in there, and they're they're not open. And then there's some sort of statue in this little alcove over here. Uh, but Lavolpe, give me a perception test at plus twenty. Lovely. Well, da -da 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 -da. Sorry, I have to close the artwork. I'm keeping it up. Uh, perception plus twenty. I guess I can. Plus six. Okay, I'll put I'll put seven. these put these two here for you, so you can see them. And I guess I can put all the council members on the map for you too here that are actually here. Oh, you know what? You can't see their names, can you? Let me change that. Okay, how much did you have? Plus six. Plus six. Okay, well. Uh, it's very easy for you to hear uh, 
what she is saying. And basically, she's just kind of laughing and, uh, you know, just talking to all these people here. Hold on. Trying to multitask too much. Okay, I just want to test. Can you guys see his name? That token right here? Yep. All right, perfect. Okay, I'll just do this while I while I talk. These two, you don't know their names yet, so you don't know who they are. Uh, but the, the girl kind of laughs, and, and she's like, oh, and then, and then Amara told me that he, he got down on one knee, and he asked her to marry her. And, oh, it's just so lovely. I'm so happy for her. And uh, then the, the guy kind of chimes in a little bit, and they seem to know Amara personally is how, how it sounds. Um, you don't find out their names as they talk, but it seems to you like they may be a uh, family of some sort. Uh, I seem to have lost my map. What? Can you scroll in or out? Sometimes that could be it. Or just switch to another map and come back to this one. Uh, it won't let me. What do you mean? It won't let you what? Go to a different map. It says canvas drawing is failed. Uh, maybe let me just reload. Yeah, that sounds like a critical failure. <laughs> But anyway, I'm. It's. I don't need to see it. Like all of it right now. I'll yeah. get it back. Hmm. The cat is back. Now it's all gray. The entire board. Can you see anything? I can't see anything. Hmm. It's on. It's supposed to be on ground. Ground floor. Floor one. Right. Yep. Hmm. Well, I have no idea. All right. Oh, I think it's just loading very, very slowly. So I'll just Could continue be. on. All right. And sorry, th this room that's near the bottom of the map, near the number nine, there's a double mm -hmm. doors there. Is that one locked and closed or are people coming going through there as well? That is locked and closed. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, I just killed that guy. Anyway, uh, as you were. Uh, so she was talking about someone uh, getting proposed to? Amara. Uh, what the, else the is she saying? Uh, I mean, as you listen, it's clear that these two are either friends or perhaps family members of Amara's. And the way they talk about her is, you know, they talk kind of rather fondly and as if they uh, they probably know her personally in some capacity. Mm -hmm. huh, so probably like a cousin or something, maybe. Uh, it could be, but you can definitely tell those two are related to each other brother and sister probably hmm. all right uh do i do i hear uh the people talking to them address them in, in a certain way as as i listen like i'll say i'll listen for about like five minutes or so well, you you had what seven success levels uh it's six just, it's just disgusting yes you do the girl her name is boniel b-o-n-i-e-l And the boy's name is Gutiel, G-U-T-E-L-E. -E. Boniel oh, and Gutiel. Okay. And uh, you eventually discover that they are indeed brother and sister, and they are cousins of Amara. Okay. Cool. Kind of deducted that pretty well. Uh. I see. So they still have kind of a big crowd? Like, I'd have to push my way in to talk to them? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'll keep an eye on them and see another opportunity to talk to them, maybe when there's less uh, people around them. And uh, okay. I'll continue making my way over to uh, Ruger. Okay. Uh, Mort and Egon, what are you guys doing? Um, I'd want to basically check out that double door to the east and just people are coming and going and see what, what's past there. Uh, of course, got to reveal more of the map here. Excellent. Okay, so you open this and it is a large, large hallway with another set of doors at the end. And um, it looks like it connects to another section of the palace here. 
and there is let me just find my number okay um the statue there are many statues lined on either side of the hallway um they're all stone but they are intricately and expertly carved um they all seem to be of various they're not duplicates they're all of individuals um and as you begin to read and kind of check what they are it turns out they are all supposed to be renditions of the original chieftains that formed the empire with Sigmar back in the day. Mm. And what are all their names? No, I'm kidding. Oh, give me a minute. I could probably. No, find I'm it sure you could. You don't <laughs> so yeah, that's that's what you see more there, and you can see people are kind of walking through. Some are you know admiring the artwork in here. Uh, others, you know, just you know, the sheer grandness of the palace. And you can see there's people coming and going between the last door at the end of the hall as well. Okay. So, yeah, it seems like this is open to the guests also. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, because Mort has been reading through that book that was given to him by uh, by Caprice Holden about, you know, Sigmar and whatnot. Do I recognize some of the names of some of the people in this hall, some of the people names I've seen in the book that uh, Caprice gave me? Um, no, because the book you have focuses more on Sigmar's early life okay. uh, before. It's more like his his family and childhood life before he basically started trying to unite the Empire. Okay. Um, that book does not really go into any detail beyond his teenage years. It's like right up to basically when his father is no longer in the picture and he becomes the head of the tribe. Um, so there's, there's a couple battles that him and his friends take part in. You learn a little bit more about like his close circle of friends, the woman that he was in love with. And, um, there's one friend in particular who dies during a battle. And the whole point of the story is that Sigmar felt the order he gave to his friend is what got him killed. But the writing is like, you know, you know, he died in battle and like he was able to basically hold this bridge so that the rest of the Sigmar's forces were able to win the battle against these orcs that were attacking. And so, you know, Sigmar feels guilty about it because it was like one of his inner circle of buddies. But the, the perspective of the writer and the author is like, you know, it, it was unfortunate, but it wasn't like it wasn't like Sigmar made a terrible mistake. It's just, you know, it happens. And soldiers die. Okay. Well, I'll continue through the hall and go to the, the other end and uh, see what's down there. Okay. Bear with me, because this is a bit of a larger room. Let's see if we can just get this in one fell swoop. Okay. So, you see a large, gigantic room that has... Oh my god, sorry. Um that has tables lined up uh kind of like you see here they're obviously they're lined up straight and they this looks like where everyone's eventually going to have dinner there are tons of tables lined up here uh china and silverware has been set up no food has been set up yet and you can see at the at the front here there's like a raised area with uh, a very large long table that um I'm sorry, not a table. There's another stage there, it looks like, for someone to do some sort of entertainment. These walls here on the east side of the room are massive stained glass windows. Uh, it almost, to you, like, it, like they, they remind you of what you'd see, like, in a temple. It's very, very weird. But, you know, it's a noble's palace, so who knows. There's a set of doors on either side that you can tell leads out into this, this like, garden or courtyard in back. Um, you can see through some of the stained glass you can see outside, but being it's stained glass, you can't make out all the details. And then you can see there are openings here and here where you can see another one of the guards with the spears guarding the opening. You're not sure where that goes. When you walk in here, there's plenty of people in here too, Mort, so there's people kind of mingling and gathering. You can see people coming and going through the doors into the uh, the garden as well. Um, you see that basically here, uh, above you, if you're in if you're in this large room, uh, if you look up here, 
there is a balcony that looks down over this room. There's okay. a big, like, guardrail, and you can see it looks like there's a table set up there, a huge long table with an elaborate tablecloth and design, and you can see that uh, there's something set up there, but you can't... Um, uh, you, you can't see much now. This this you probably can see as you walk around. Um, you can see there's an alcove here, where this guard is with some statues, and there's a staircase that goes up. This one, you see, there's an alcove here, and this goes further into some sort of hallway, but you can't see what's in there. Okay. And uh, are there also people who are like mingling outside in the garden as well too? Is that part of the uh, the party area? Yes, it looks like that's open to guests also. Um, again, the guards are blocking anyone from going into these two areas, but it looks like these other doors are open to the, uh, the party. Well, I might as well just keep on going and I'll make my way out to the garden and see uh, what there is kind of like at the end here. Okay. Um... Just checking. So one thing that's impossible to miss when you're in this large room is there is uh, one of these panels, this glass, stained glass, uh, is currently, it looks like it's being um, reconstructed. Perhaps one of them was damaged or a new one is being placed, but it strikes you as odd because they're so huge, obviously very expensive. Um, one of them basically has like a, a placeholder covering um, so that it's not exposed to the elements outside. But one of the large panels is is no longer there. Oh, interesting. Is it kind of the upper part of the window, or the lower part of the window? These windows, like the windows themselves are probably like 10 feet tall. So is it the whole panel, the whole window that's missing or just like a section of it? It's the whole thing. Oh, shit. Yeah. So yeah, whoever threw that baseball probably in some pretty big trouble. Hey, you probably got thrown off the tower here. After the keep. <laughs> That's what you got to do, man. Yeah. Get off my lawn. All right. Well, then I'll make my way out to the garden. Okay. As you walk through the invisible wall, apparently. Um, so when you get out to the garden, that's fine. <laughs> so you get out to the garden and a uh, couple things. There are gates here and here that, you know, you can see lead out to other parts of the, the other two courtyards. The gates are currently closed. You don't see anyone going through them. Um, this area beyond is like an overlook. Each of these little rooms actually has a little roof on it. You're, you're still outside, but think of it kind of like a uh, like a gazebo or like a like an overlook at like a park or something. So there are okay. there are roofs to this, roofs, roofs. Um, and you can see outwards. And when you look down, you know, you're looking, this, this whole section juts out probably a good 50 to 70 feet from the wall itself. And this, when you look down, you're looking down like the cliff face you can tell is like underneath you. So like if you were to jump off, you would just go straight down probably a good 50 or more feet. I die. Okay. GG. Yep. GG. Did you like, did you like the party? Yeah, yeah that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two other things you notice. When you look through this gate here, you can see there is a large building which you are pretty sure would be either a stables or a coach house. Now that you're here, you can tell that's almost certainly what it is, but the, the two giant doors on it are currently closed. And something that strikes you as rather odd is that unlike the rest of the uh, shrubbage and foliage you saw here, the garden looks in terrible condition. Really? Most of the plants and plants and flowers are wilting or like look kind of sickly or like they just haven't been tended to. There's a lot of parts that are overgrown. Um, it reminds you a lot of Va uh, Lord Ashenberg's I was just going to say, 
Hmm. Suspicious. Someone's got some slass or schlath or whatever the fuck it's called. Well, last time oh, that the happened, there was a cult underground, so... Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Unkept gardens are a telltale sign of the cult. That's the first thing that goes, the gardens. Telltale sign of heresy. <laughs> I mean, yep. just look at this dining hall. They can't even get the table straight. I mean, it's a yeah. mess. I, I learned that on day one. <laughs> um, Is there any, still so looking at the garden, is there any, any more obvious damage to the garden, particularly outside of the area with the broken glass panel? Why don't you go ahead and give me a perception test? La Volpe is 100% with your idea to just burn this place to the ground and save us oh, yeah. trouble. Yeah. But everyone by the time hears this it on it. over, this keep is gone. Yes. There's no way this place is surviving that. What I roll. Oh, we've become anarchists so fast. Hey, man. Uh, fail. Heresy, no no bounds. Fail? Yeah. Damn, okay. Right. You do not find anything else out of the ordinary. <clears throat> All right. Um, these, these two like side rooms here. Are these anything of note, or more just like like gazebo lookout areas, like to admire the view out the city? They're more gazebo lookout areas. Uh, those ones actually have seats, so you can sit down. Um, whereas the other ones more of like a standing viewing platform. Okay, gotcha. I don't know if you can see it in the uh, the picture of the castle I gave you. Oh, uh, the, the 3D one you had. Yeah, I remember seeing okay. the, the picture from that. Yeah. Let me pull that up. Overview. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you can't really see it in the picture, but like, you know, when you go in there, there are windows and stuff that look out of the castle. And okay. the, little, the little wall that's on the very east side of the picture between the two round rooms yeah that is exposed there is no roof there that is just a railing i just spread my arms and leave gg how many places to fall off in this place you want a lot of places to push people off me too <laughs> i think chris is giving us a hint you know let's go go over <laughs> the edge I, i'm gonna look you down could, are there any bodies everyone? sitting there you know uh, well, at this point, Mort, it's getting a little dark, so it's a little hard to see all the way down there. I have but dark vision. Doesn't matter, you can't see it, I said so, I'm the GM. Uh, Fuck this game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Egon, what are you uh, up to? So, um, I am still in that, uh, room eight with the, with the major crowd, um, and I would probably be looking around for any suspicious behavior. Give me a perception test. A. Hey. Oh, my boy. You see wow. more looking over edges of everything. Wow. How about a how about critical a critical failure? Nice. How about a fortune Time to point? use them rerolls, buddy. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm hit a fortune point. Okay. Uh, we're gonna try that again. Oh. Ugh. I mean, there's so one. many people. There's so many people here right now. It's yeah. really hard to keep track of everybody. And yeah. I mean, to you, it all seems suspicious because these are all noble, you know, noblemen. Yeah, I'm just paranoid now. As you should be. Doesn't mean they're not after you. Everybody is two rats in a trench coat. Do you do anything else? Or you just kind of keeping an eye out. Uh, yeah, I, you know, Egon's not one for these sort of affairs, so he would kind of just stick close to uh, one of the corners and just let things happen. Okay. Uh, well, Lavolpe, then, we'll, we'll go back to you. Uh, what, what are you up to at this point? So, I'm going to try and talk to Ruger and just kind of, you know, Lavolpe kind of looks at him like, well, he seems like the hardest working guy here, you know, and maybe he's not uh, like the rest of these nobles. You know, he might have his ear to the ground a little bit more, and he might be a little bit better source of information. 
that's okay. Volpe's kind of like, uh, I guess, idea. Okay. Um, well, you get over there. Are you trying to actually talk to him or just listen in to, onto what? Uh, I'll listen in at first because, you know, I don't want to say anything stupid. So I'll, I'll listen in for a minute, see what he's talking about. And, you know, I'll, yeah. Well, it looks like uh, him and Zimmerman are talking with, you know, a couple other people and they are discussing um, some uh, some some boats or shipments of uh, coal that apparently the young fruits young Freuds have been sending, and uh, apparently one of them was attacked by some sort of river bandits, and uh, you know there's all sorts of rumors and stories as to. You know, that was a big source of income for the Jungfreuds. And so, you know, that's going to probably affect their fortunes. But also, there's a bit of worry that it's going to start affecting Ubersreich because that was their primary method to get coal. And now that that family has been ousted, uh, the city's starting to have coal shortages. That sounds like a lot to deal with. Um... Huh. Can Lavolpe make an intelligence roll to try and find a way to uh, get in on the conversation? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Give me a. We'll just be intelligence. Let's do an intuition test, or perhaps a gossip test. Uh, all right. Let's try gossip. Oh, 99! Hoo hoo, my bro. Alright, I'm gonna re-roll. Okay. Do a... get a 1. Alright, that is horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah Lavolpe kind of is like, hmm, seems like they're talking about something really, really important. Uh, maybe, uh... Maybe I come back when uh, they are less preoccupied. Uh, Mort, how about you? Um, I'll do my way back to the main party area. Okay. Um. And, uh, I think I tried to talk to the, uh, kind of listen and talk to the the, the two, uh, twins over here. They're not twins, but the, the Brother sister combo. Okay. Um, high or low? Low. Okay. You see a moment where it looks like uh, Gutiel, the young man, is not terribly occupied and looks like he's enjoying a drink and getting a little something to eat from one of the servants. Uh, I'll approach him and say, Ah, is it Gutiel? Is that correct? He turns and uh, he kind of nods. He says, uh, yes. And you are? Uh, I am Bort. <laughs> Bort, uh, Bort Valiant. <laughs> uh, uh, Heisman sent him, sent me here to uh, in his stead to participate in this lovely occasion. He says, uh, uh, Uncle Heisman. Oh, give me a... Uh, give me a... I would say a gossip or a charm test at plus 40. Ooh, I'm going to need it after my, my recent uh, corruption thing. Ooh. Oh, no. <laughs> Nurgle is upon you with a 77 negative mm. one critical failure. Mm. Uh... You, you kind of go to introduce yourself, and for a moment his eyes kind of like like widen, uh, you know, when he sees you. And when you introduce yourself, you're like kind of like stumbling over your words. And you, uh, as you go to like extend your hand to like be like nice to meet you, you like trip and you knock the glass oh. out of his hand over oh. uh, like part of his jacket. But most of it hits his sister's dress. 
Oh, oh no! Oh my god, get my fucking oh, coat. Poor. <laughs> and uh, he, he like, uh, he kind of laughs when it hits his sister's, um, you know, dress a little bit. Like, you know, he's more, he doesn't care so much about that. Obviously, he looks a little upset when it gets on his clothes. And she kind of like lets out like an audible, like, what? Like a little bit of a scream, like, do you have any idea how expensive? Oh, my God goodness what are you doing and there's everyone in the hall can hear this outburst and i'll be can you, can you pause the music <laughs> record scratch that's, that's perfect yeah it's just like everybody hears this and it's like dead silent for a moment i i really go it's like it's like grabbing some neck and like, i'm so sorry i'm so sorry trying to like <laughs> you have a spell? With the clothes, the clothes. <laughs> don't you have uh, a good spell for this a clean clothes spell? No, I, I do not know. have that spell. You see several uh, uh, attendants come to her, and she's like, unbelievable, ruined, the dress is ruined. And uh, Gutiel kind of laughs a little bit at her, and they begin to uh, make their way upstairs, and like part of their entourage, and several oh students go yeah. with them. Oh, wow. March face is beat red right now <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of like kind of like one of these like i never in all my days i just unbelievable these goons and just yep amazing but my clothes are fine right that's the important part right oh yeah yeah fantastic <laughs> oh oh that. how embarrassing <laughs> pretty amazing well, uh, uh, even Volpe with the casually strides, <laughs> the Volpe casually strides over and is just, I hand you a new drink. And I'm like, well, um, this is going swimmingly. <laughs> oh, goodness. I have one job. Ugh. You guys notice that Benedict is like on the far side of this room, uh, obviously drawing whatever's in this alcove over here. And, uh, Lavolpe, when you like look over there, you see that he's kind of looking in the direction. You can see him shake his head like, "Oh fucking shit," um, and goes back to drawing whatever he's drawing. Uh, upon upon uh, Gutiel and uh, Boniel, Bonil, isn't it right? Ba Boniel. Boniel. Uh, I, I too will leave the room and be like, "Oh god, I'll get out of here." <laughs> <laughs> Well, Egon, you see Mort uh, basically cause a scene and then uh, dips away out of you. <laughs> and obviously, Lavolpe, you see that as well. Well, then, I suppose it's up to us. I suppose so. <laughs> Uh, hmm. uh, you guys okay with going a little bit longer since we've had some tough technical difficulties tonight? Uh, yeah, like one? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It works for me. Yeah, I can do that. All right, cool. Um, well, I, I, uh... Boy, I'll try and watch for them to come back down. So I feel like they'll come back down at some point. And uh, maybe we can uh, offer them something in return. Like maybe we can do their portrait or something like that. Um, do something nice. Hey, well, them. eventually Benedict comes back over, you know, to kind of, you know, quote unquote, show you what he's working on. But then obviously to talk. And he's like, what in the Sigmar's name happens? Ah, well, uh, I, I think Mort uh, was a little clumsier than he thought. Maybe he had too much uh, wine, but uh, I think I overheard them say they are uh, cousins to Amara. Oh. They might be good people to talk to, and uh, also, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, he see Oh, I was going to say he seemed... Uh, very happy at the mention of his uncle. Uh, well, I mean, you are family. Um, 
Well, I mean, he's family, so perhaps they haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, that is uh, uh, that is what I'm thinking. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, he's like, any any luck? Anything else in here going on? I think I'm just trying to get a lay of the land here. Same. Uh, it's uh, hard to break into conversation. Everyone <clears throat> seems to be talking about a uh, lot of big business and uh, other other events and woes that are happening. I did uh, overhear the bolters talking about uh, these uh, the problems they have been having. Um, I was going to talk to that Ruger, but uh, trying to find a way in the, in the conversation. Perhaps maybe uh, if we join uh, together, it won't look as strange. Are you good at doing uh, quick sketches? He's like, oh yeah, of course. Maybe, uh, maybe that is uh, something we can do. You can uh, give him a quick little sketch while I talk to them. Uh, he's like, sure. He's like, uh, he's like, lead the way. I'll, I'll, I can follow. All right, lead I'll go back it. over to Ruger and uh, and kind of introduce. Uh, well, I see. Is he still talking to the same group of dudes? Uh, no. It looks like the after the the wine incident of you know, 2021. Um, there's, uh, some of the people have kind of shifted around the, uh, the, uh, band, the band has, uh, very obviously started playing a new song, um, after excellent. that happens and yeah, people are kind of moving around talking to different people, but cool. Benedict is with you. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll work my way over to him again and, uh, introduce myself and, uh, ask if he would like, uh, um, a portrait. Okay. How exactly do you introduce yourself? I uh, say, uh, you know, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, the fake name that I already forgot what I called myself. Uh, Eduardo Rodrigo uh, Empanada. Em Rodrigo Empanada. Rodrigo uh, Empanada. I'm here on behalf of, uh, um, not, uh, yeah, Heisman von Brunner. Um, I'm also here with uh, some of my court artists. We're just uh, giving portraits of some of the more... Uh, Dramatis Personae here, uh, and I was wondering if you would like your portrait to add to the collection of tonight. Give me a charm at plus 40. Right. Yeah, you probably shouldn't be playing by plus the aliens. Seven. I, I plus will seven. note my my crit fail would have been a crit success if I didn't have the corruption thing from last week. <laughs> Put that out there. <laughs> awesome. Plus seven. Wow. Uh, well, he seems to warm up to you really quickly when you introduce yourself, and he offers his hand uh, when you offer yours and gives you a, a firm handshake, especially for a guy that seems kind of frail and old. And, uh, you know, he... I mean, the picture looks pretty decrepit. He's not far off from that. You can definitely tell he does have, like, a bandage over his head. It's not bloody or anything, but clearly he had some sort of injury recently. He's kind of got it covered up by a, by a hat, but it's, you know, not doing a great job. But, yeah, he gives you a handshake, and he says, Oh, part of the family, eh? Uh, yes, I am uh, I am his, his master's uh, swords master. I also helped train him. I say you have the look of a, a scrapper, my uh, my friend. You have a very strong grip. He says, "Well, I've been been plying the rivers between here and Altdorf and everywhere in between my whole life." Uh, and he, uh, uh, you know, he introduces himself to you. He says, "Karsten Rugger. I'm the uh, field master of the Boatman's Guild here in Ubersreich." Ah. Uh. Lord, uh, Lord Rugger, uh, I, we had a good friend who was a, a boatman like you, lived on the docks his whole life. Uh, and Lavolpe remembers Firth for a moment. But I digress. Um, he, he nods to that. He seems to appreciate that. But he's like, I, no, no lord, please. Uh, just it's just Rugger's fine. Rugger, it is a, it is a very difficult life. There are... Uh, the waterways are a very dangerous place nowadays. I suppose they always have been, but uh, maybe more so now. Yes. Yep. Never. Uh, always got to be on the lookout for bandits, beastmen, goblins, trolls. Those are the worst. Oh, is that what gave you that whack on your head? 
Uh, no, no, this was, uh, just typical day-to-day -day knocks on the docks, loading cargo and things like that. Uh, I see. Well, I think the ladies like a story better than that. Maybe we'll, uh, have to think of one for you later tonight. <laughs> uh, he laughs I... at that. He seems to, uh, to agree, and, uh, he kind of, like, you know, taps your glass, you know, your glasses together at that. Yeah. Um... I'll say I, I, I am a uh, stranger here. I've met some of these folks. Uh, I have uh, I have observed uh, the my lord's nephew and niece, I believe. And I point to the area. Uh, seems like they came under some misfortune uh, early on in the party. I do hope uh, she has a spare dress. Um, give me an intuition test. Plus, uh, plus 20. Uh, succeed by five degrees. You do catch a glimpse of a smile on his face, like when you mention the, the dress fiasco, but he doesn't say anything. But you catch a, a glimpse over that, that he, he obviously got some amusement out of that misfortune. <laughs> uh, she will get over it, but uh, I understand how upset the young lady uh, would be at that happening uh are they uh tell me of his family are they good kids what do they study he says i would think you would know more than i do being uh being his an employee and all i uh i just i know they like to throw a lot of parties around here it's usually the two of them uh you know having all the balls and everything around here Hmm, I see. Uh, in this in this same castle? Oh, yeah. Yeah, th those two seem to have the run of the place most of the time. At least from what I hear. I see. Uh, do they, uh, the three of them, uh, Amara and them, are they, uh, they are very close, it seems. Uh, I mean, as far as, I guess as far as I could tell, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know them personally myself, but, um, you know, Mara, I know she lives here in the, in the palace, and, uh, I understand that, uh, the two cousins are here quite frequently as well, usually, uh, usually visiting their grandmother, to my understanding. Ah, uh, the grandmother. Uh, how is her health? I don't know. Haven't uh, haven't seen an appearance from her tonight. I see. Uh, I, I noticed uh, some more on the council are not here. Uh, where's uh, uh, the lady uh, knocked? Would, is that how I would probably know her honorific? Um. Well, you know, she's not part of the council. She's a representative, direct representative of the emperor. Um. But yeah, Lady Noct is is how you would uh, you would like speak of her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I asked that. He says, "Well, I don't know uh, exactly where Lady Noct might be tonight. Um, perhaps uh, she deems something like this beneath her attention, trying to run this whole city and all." Uh, you're right about that. Although I, I would find it hard to believe that uh, the Von Bruners wouldn't have extended an invitation to someone like her, but, I mean, Dabernick is here, so not sure why she isn't. Not that the two of them really get along or anything, but... I see. Uh... Dabernick. Hold on, I have to pull up the photo. <laughs> He's the general of the army. Okay. I'd say he must be a busy man. Uh, how goes the war against chaos on his side? Uh, he's like, um... Uh, well, he's not really fighting a war against chaos. I, I'm sure you've heard of uh, what's been going on here in, in Ubersreich, if you're, uh, if you're from Altdorf. The cults? He's like, Do no. I know what he's talking about? Yeah, give me a, give me an intelligence test at plus 
40. Uh, succeed by six. He's referring to the fact that the Emperor sent his army to basically take hold of Ubersreich from the Young Freud family. And you know that right now nobody seems to know why the Emperor gave that order. Oh, there... I'm sorry. I thought that was way in the past and not currently. No, that's what's currently going on. I mean, okay. the, the seizure of Uber Strike happened, you know, like it wasn't like yesterday, but right. probably within the last year or two. Okay. All right. Yeah, I totally, yeah, for some reason. And you, I... you, you know that that's a big talking point in the city right there are, there are patrols of the empire soldiers that go through and you know a lot of people just because they've lived here for so long were loyal to the young freuds and a lot of those people have been driven out or forced into hiding or have been arrested or even executed on the spot for being sympathizers to a quote-unquote enemy but there's no explanation as to why the emperor gave this order why the army has suddenly shown up. there's a lot of rumors but there's nothing official Yes, it's a very touchy subject, friend. One that can get you on the wrong side of the law, I understand. But, uh... Yeah, that's, hey, that's the truth. That's for sure. I, I'm curious to hear your take on it. Give me another charm test at plus 20. No judgment. <laughs> I, I can say I, uh... I do not really have a, uh, a horse in the race currently. Plus three. He says uh, that's exactly the type of thing that uh, someone who is part of the family would say. He's like, but what I will tell you is um, a lot of us would just like some answers from the Emperor as to why he just showed up and took over. Yes. You know, if, if it was... If it was because of uh, the young Freuds building up their power and getting ready to start a civil war, well, why can't he just say that? You know, I think I think most people would understand. You wanna you wanna keep peace and keep things from spiraling out of control, but uh, you know how it is. Uh, all these old families and nobles bickering amongst each other. Everybody wants a piece of the pie, and uh, you know us working folk get stuck in the middle. That is a very honest assessment. I uh, I have to believe there's something more nefarious going on if that is how the Emperor is treating it. Well, but that is my suspicion. If, if you believe any of the rumors you hear down here in Uber's Reich, uh, you know, some people think that uh, there's something going on in the Imperial Court. And maybe the Emperor himself is uh, is in on something or in danger. You know, nobody tells us anything. Yes, the, uh, the lack of information is what will kill us in the end, it seems. And Lady Noct and Dabernick aren't, uh, aren't really forthcoming with any details. I don't hear any, uh, any word for that. You know, she plays things pretty close to the vest, and, well, you know, he's got a couple, whatever, a couple hundred, couple thousand troops at his back. You know, nobody's gonna cross swords with him. Mm -mm. I'm curious, uh... Where are his troops stationed currently? Well, they pretty much, you know, just kicked in the door and took over uh, Black Rock Castle. That's where the Young Freuds, uh, that's their family home. That's where they ruled from. So they showed up, entered the city, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, they, they say that uh, Young Freud himself got out, and now he's holed up somewhere in the mountains in one of the other family estates or castles. And, uh, you know, they're not just going to send troops up there. That'd be a bloodbath. So they've taken out one of their main seats of power and executed a bunch of sympathizers. The hell, you can see some corpses hanging from the walls of the castle. You know, state troopers wandering around on patrol. Bad enough, you got the town guard here and there. Nobody knows who to trust anymore. Is uh, truly uh, the beginnings of a horrible affair. Uh, you've given me much to think of, friend. 
Seems the world becomes uh, more dire and dire than uh, the days when we were uh, younger, yes? Things only get darker, never brighter. Yeah, well, I suppose that's why I stick to the river. Something I know. Something, uh, something I'm good at. There is uh, comfort in uh, simplicity, no? Cheers to that, friend. Okay, he get cheers you and uh, uh, he kind of continue to, to wander around and then uh, we'll, we'll head back over to Mort here. Mort, after, I guess, collecting himself for a minute, he will uh, kind of trash himself off a little bit and make his way back to the party. Okay. And see, see if the situation's calmed down a little bit. Yeah, it has. Things appear to be back to normal. You see that Benedict and LaVolpe are speaking with uh, Rugger, and it looks like while LaVolpe is talking to him, Benedict is making a, a sketch or drawing something. You can see Egon like leaning up against one of the pillars with his arms crossed, just kind of keeping tabs on everything. Um, I would see if I can get a word in with the, uh, the Burgomeister. Okay. Uh, I didn't actually put him on here, did I? Cause I don't... Ernst. Yeah, you know what? Because he doesn't have... Oh, hold on. Yeah, uh, Ernst is the carp, the head of the carpenters. Oh, I'm sorry. There's two Ernsts. Oh, they're, they're both yeah. named Ernst. Now, look, I understand there's only so many names, but come on, Cubicle 7. Two guys on the same council of the main town that the game takes place in, and you give them both the same first name. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go by Mahler then. I mean, I understand we've got two Heinrichs in this game, but I wrote, I wrote Strauss's son before I realized that the guy in charge of this palace was also a Heinrich, so... Um, hold on, I need to give this guy a token. Oh, that's why, because he just has this. Okay, here we go. It's the group picture, but it should, there we go, it should say Burgomeister. Yep, got it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, you see him. And he's kind of rather loudly speaking uh, to a few people. Um, if I see an, app an opportunity in the conversation, I'll try to introduce myself, hopefully uh, slightly more successfully. Okay. Uh, I'll take a drink. Give me a... Um, give me a... Uh, charm test, please. At, Straight charm. Uh, plus 20. Uh, they'll they do. Okay. Uh, what do you say? I mean, you, you basically, when you get up to him, he seems to be talking a lot about, um, he seems to be praising the wine and he seems to really enjoy it. And it looks like some of the people he's talking to seem a little, uh, they're all kind of pining for his attention, is kind of what you feel. Upon hearing him say he's praising the wine, I will go grab a glass of wine and bring one over to him. Okay. Uh, well, he, he sees you and, uh, I mean, you just hand it to him? What do you say? Like, ah, oh, Burgomeister, oh, my name is uh, Bort, and I'm uh, coming here on uh, Heisman's personal request. Uh, I can't help but overhear you. are a fan of uh, today's special wine. I figured I'd uh, fill up your glass for you and kind of pour some into his cup. Uh, I mean, he seems a little, like, taken aback and suspicious at first, like, who is this guy, right? Like, just kind of randomly coming up to me. But when you pour the wine, he uh, just kind of gives you a, a, a nod of approval, and he kind of um, doesn't, like, twirl his mustache, but he kind of, like, pulls it to a, more of a point with his thumb and his uh, pointer finger. And he says, well, thank you, my good man. What elf, I should say. Ah, well, you know, yes, elf from a faraway land, uh, learning to enjoy what there is in the, within this your, your fabulous city here. Uh, lots of great, lots of wonders throughout this town. Uh, he he smiles at that. You can't tell whether he's being genuine or putting on a show, but uh, you know, you're you're kind of fluffing him up seems to to help a little bit. Ah. Uh. I haven't seen the general around, have you? 
Oh, Dabernick, uh, he's, last I saw, he was, uh, upstairs. I uh, think he was meeting, uh, with, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Heinrich. Probably uh, giving his, his gift and making his presence known. Are, are any of the general's men part of the guards that are here? Are you asking me or him? I'm just, I'm asking you. Well, you don't see anybody wearing the, you don't see any state troops. And you don't see anybody wearing the colors of Altdorf, which you know are red and blue. So okay. you don't think so. I'll, I'll kind of like jokingly say say to the Burgermeister, like, oh, his boys haven't been causing you too much trouble, have they? Ah, oh, well, um, go ahead and give me another charm at plus 20. <laughs> Pass. Ooh, right on the money. Oh, and there's the proof for you, Egon. If you roll on the money, it's a success. Oh, uh, he kind of he kind of laughs a little nervously, and he says, um, "The general is is doing his job, I suppose. Um, I mean, he hasn't kicked down any of my doors, and I understand that he's in a unique position, given." Uh, given his role in his uh, family history. That, that's good. They're still letting you, you run the city as you see fit within, within reason. Uh, well, not particularly. I mean, uh, things have certainly changed since uh, the Emperor's soldiers have shown up. Um, lady knocked is uh, doing her best, I think, to keep everything under control. And, uh, well, we don't have a civil war on our hands, so I guess the, the general and his men are doing something. But um, there's a lot of uncertainty, you see. A lot of, a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And everybody, everybody, everybody wants a peace without saying they want a peace. Rather tiresome, really. Dabernick hasn't filled you in why he's here? I mean, wouldn't you be the one person who'd have all the details? <laughs> You'd think. All we know, all that I know, is that the the Emperor decided to oust the young Freuds from the city, and he's put his troops and his general here in their place. He sent his herald here as well as his representative, but nobody knows why. And when he said that the junk fruits have been outside the city, I'll kind of like ding his glass and take a sip. Um, let's see. See how he reacts to that. Uh, he doesn't really react positive or negatively. He seems to be very neutral with that. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, he just, uh, he, he does sip. I mean, he's not rude, but... He, he plays that one close to the chest. Okay. And, uh, not, uh, I, 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 I can't, yeah, let me start that one over. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is Proc now feeling under the weather? I, I can't help but know he hasn't made his uh, appearance yet. Well, you fucking know damn well. Oh, I, I know, obviously I know why he's not there. I'm, I'm gonna see what he has to say. Give me another charm test. Still at plus 20. <laughs> Oh, my good sir, you didn't hear? He got Owen. Oh, passed by two. <laughs> uh, he got oh, his no. entire face Owen. <laughs> he says, um, well, um, Prochnow, uh, well, the, the rumor that I've heard is that, um, he was, has been a bit of a situation with his guild and the witch hunters. Oh, the witch hunters. Well, that can't be good. Any idea no. what happened? Well, I don't know all the specifics, but I have heard that uh, he was running afoul of something something sinister and uh, taken in the dead of night. Witch hunters uh, taking over the, uh, the guild house. It's been investigations and inquiries, and... He has not been seen. Ah. That a new, uh, a new guild master has uh, has stepped in for the time being. Although 
and between you and I, if the, you know if the witch hunters are involved, that um, I doubt we'll be seeing him anytime soon. Uh, who, who is the new guild master looking over of the boats now? Boat builders, um, anyway. Her name is Adelina Yvette. Okay, Adelina Yvette. Uh, and has she been uh, taken to her tasks well? I know it's uh, a tough position to fill so with, under such short notice. Um, I, I would say things have been an okay transition. I mean, it was just kind of thrust upon her. I don't know much about her, really. I've only uh, had the pleasure of meeting her once or twice. Um, but she, uh, she seems to be trying, so... I have, I suppose, I, uh, imagine she has her hands full with the, um, well, with the witch hunters and the Templars running around. Uh, I imagine so. Trying to do any sort of work with the witch hunters and getting up in your business can't be easy. No, no, I suspect, uh, business is probably not exactly booming for them right now. Hmm. Well, I hope that the witch hunters haven't bothered you, have they? Uh, no. No, no, they have not. Um, and as for a matter of fact, uh, neither has uh, Adelina, uh, thank goodness. She's one of the only ones who hasn't been uh, constantly hounding me for a favor here or there. Good, good. Uh, have you had uh, a chance to speak with uh, Heinrich yet? Um... I did, yes, uh, but uh, I, su I suspect uh, I'll have a chance when we when we have dinner. Um, but uh, yes, I've made my appearance, I've given my gifts, wished the family well, and uh, just enjoying some company and catching up and being constantly bedraggled by all these others around here. You can tell he's obviously talking about some of the guild masters. They were bedraggled? Yeah, kind of like like annoyed or bothered, you know. You get the feeling that he he's growing very tired of all these people trying to court favors from him. Doesn't that uh, isn't it nice though to have been that position of power and people need things from you? You have the the, the the final say what they can and can't do. Surely that must give you some sort of satisfaction. Uh, give me a intuition test at plus twenty. Oh, fail by two. He uh, he says to you, you're not sure if he's being, you know, truthful or, or honest, uh, but he says it gets a bit tiring, to be honest. Well, surely you can have some of your aides assist you with that? Uh, yes, but everybody seems to think that uh, that I have all the answers and all the, uh, the power here when, uh, well, I'm just in the dark as most of them are. Well... Well, as long as you do the best with the information you've got, that's the best. That's all you can do, right? Indeed. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind seeing Ubersreich become a freebird, especially after all this nonsense. It'd be a breath of fresh air to uh, be able to do things on our own. But you know, we'll see what happens in the coming months. Would they still be under the protection of the Empire, through Freeburg? Oh yes, yes, of course. Um, I, I keep forgetting. You may not be accustomed to how things are here in the Empire, um, but uh, yes, uh, if a town is granted Freeburg status, then basically, for lack of a better term, they have the autonomy to kind of run themselves as their own separate governance. They uh, there's some reduction on taxes to the local uh, province or the local duchy or county, whatever they may be part of. Um, they are, of course, responsible for their own def immediate defense and protection, but we'd still be considered part of the Empire and Imperial citizens, so if something truly bad were to happen, uh, you know, the Elector Count of the Reichland, which, of course, is uh, our great Emperor Karl Franz himself, would, uh, you know, we'd be under his protection. Uh, and the, the Emperor wouldn't look down upon the Uber's Reich for, for taking that stance? Well, I would hope not. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't think anything like that would happen without the Emperor's blessing in one way, shape, or form, whether it came from Lady Noct or the Emperor himself. But uh, she speaks with his authority, and that's why she's here. So uh, best-case scenario, I think, for Ubersreich would be to 
be granted Freeburg status and for the Emperor's army to go back to Altdorf and let things settle down here. Let us uh, deal with things ourselves. You know, I'm sure another power family will will emerge as uh, as the one kind of leading everything, but um, I mean... Uh, say what you will about the the, the young Freuds, but uh, Ubersreich was certainly not starving with them in power, and they have been here for many many years. Um, I mean, you know, any town's going to have a bit of a disturbance when something like this happens, and the ruling people are taken out, uh, out of power that is. And then you see that uh, another. Um, uh, another, uh, the, the large guy, Furman, the guild master of the Carters, comes over, and he's like, um, he starts talking to the Burgomeister about the wine, and go ahead and give me an intuition test at plus 20. Hold on, I had to, my, my, my cat jumped up on my computer tower and pushed the power button on my computer and started shutting my whole system down. Oh no! Fortunately, I had an unsafe document, so I was able to stop the whole restart process <clears throat> with the notes going. I'm re rejoining now. Okay. I was like, man, Mort went really quiet there for a second. Yeah, that because uh, cats <laughs> pushing power buttons on computers. Bad cat. <laughs> well, luckily, with my computer tower under the desk here, I don't think he can actually get to the power button. He'd have to really right. try. <laughs> uh, am I rolling here? I'm sorry. Uh, intuition at plus 20. Okay. So we'll put this guy over here next to the Burgomeister. Oh, crit. Okay. So Furman comes over and he's got a glass of wine and he's like, Ernst, have you tried this? It's absolutely delicious. I think it's, uh, I think it might be crushed grapes from Everland. And you see Ernst like he has this look on his face like oh my goodness like what the fuck are you talking about and he's like he's like he's like Furman or, or what was this guy's first name um they're, they're both Ernst uh no Ernst is the no this guy's Hans Ernst is the carpenter uh so the burgomeister says to Furman he says Hans that that's a um that's a peach-based wine, not grape. And he's like, you can tell, and he starts to, like, ra rattle some stuff off, you know, that only a actual wine connoisseur would know. And you see that Furman looks down at his drink as if he's surprised by this, like, oh. Um, and you can tell this guy is, like, acting like he knows everything about wines, and he doesn't know shit. That, that's Hans? Yeah, Hans Furman. Duh. He's a wine expert who doesn't know anything. All right. That, yeah, that's that's what you get when uh, when he when he does that. Mm -hmm. Um, and but you can tell that they obviously they're on a first name basis, so they they refer to each other by their first names. Um, and then uh, Egon, what are you up to over in the corner? Still still uh, sulking and skulking? Yeah, just uh, eyes darting back back and forth between people seeing if somebody's gonna you know turn into a big giant demon or something well uh there are no demonic metamorphoses that take place uh but you do see that uh mort has returned and seems to be getting on with the burgomeister and uh the guild master of the carter's guild you can see that la volpe and benedict are making some progress in a conversation with rugger and eventually you do see that um uh, one of the servants uh, comes by, actually probably the, well, not the steward, but a servant comes by and he says, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Rein, Reinholt, was it? Reiner? Uh, that'd be Reinhardt. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, my lord. I, 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 I'm I, sorry, there's a lot of guests and I, I, I apologize, I don't recognize you, but I understand that... Um, uh, you're here on Lord Heisman's behalf, correct? Correct. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, speak, uh, and he kind of looks at, um, in La Volpe's direction, he's like looking for the right words, like, you're, um, uh, you know, he looks like he's about to say, like, master, 
and he's like, uh, but uh, he seems terribly busy right now with uh, with Lord Rugger. But um, if you'd like, uh, the the line is almost finished. If you'd like to come up and uh, and see Lord uh, Heinrich and and the rest of the family. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I'll I'll get uh, everybody else, and we'll we'll head up. He says, uh, oh, "Great." He's like, I'll, "I'll meet you by the stairs." Thank you very much. And so Egon comes to get the group of you, and you basically have a chance now where you will be permitted to meet Lord Heinrich von Brunner. And I think that will be a good place to call it for tonight. So, thank you all once again, listeners. We have finally made it to von Brunner Palace, and we celebrate a year of Gallows Geist here on Dragon's Greed Gaming. Thank you all so very much. Uh, it'll be many weeks and months before you hear this, but once again, happy 4th of July to everybody out there. And we got plenty more Geist coming up, and maybe even some Alien. Ooh, what's that about in the future? Well, we'll see. Uh, check back around Halloween time. Good shit coming up so thanks again everybody love having you love playing thanks to my players and we will see you all same place same time 99